Hello YouTube, how's everyone doing? It's Professional here. So today, I finally have the lore video on Pegorino. This is a video that I promised two years ago, but I got held up with so many other projects, so I want to thank everyone for being patient with me. Thank you guys for waiting on this. These lore videos do take a bit of time, but I will work on doing them faster in the future with at least one major lore video a month. Anyways, in this video, we are going to be talking about Jimmy Pegorino, the boss of the Pegorino family, and why he never got on the commission. We will also talk uh, about why the other family see him as a joke and laugh at him. I'll also mention what I think he could have done to actually get on the commission. But anyways, let's start the video. Now before we go any further in the video explaining Pegorino's lore, I wanted to go over one quick thing, which is what is the commission? And why does Pegorino so desperately want to get in on it? I want to keep relations sweet with at least one of the families that got a seat on the commission. You're gonna get a seat on that commission real soon, ain't you boss? About time old and you got some representation in the city. Don't tell me what's due to me! I've been waiting for this and working hard for this for years. All that ain't worth nothing without me. My old man, God rest his soul, didn't have the balls to bring the family to the level I got it to. I'm gonna get that seat because of what I done. Sit down next to John Gravelli if he survives that long and run all of Liberty City. The whole country, maybe. The Pavanos, are they gonna offer you a seat then? They can't give me a seat, but they can help me get one. Ain't nobody been given a seat since the commission got founded. Shit. Times has changed. Since Rico, the commission ain't the same. They need a family with a new approach to be sitting down with them. I got a nice little offering to the Pavanos that's gonna persuade them to argue my case. Something real classy. Real nice. Now, the Commission is actually a real-life organization. It is not just in GTA 4, but GTA 4's version of the Commission is based on the real-life New York City Commission. So, the Commission is basically a meeting place between the five families. So, it is a meeting place where the five Mafia families meet together to basically discuss business. The purpose of the Commission is so that Mafia families can resolve disputes with each other and do business with each other without conflicts, without basically going to war, killing each other, disrupting each other's operations. The commission is set up precisely so it outlines what family controls what. This family might control this turf, this family controls this turf, this family is not to go on this turf, and if there is some kind of conflict, the commission basically steps in and is meant to resolve the dispute, but it can also end deadly for a family, meaning that if a family steps out of line and the other families are not this one one family might go against the commission, the other families might team up on them and just eliminate them. So it's base, it's a prestigious thing to be a member of the commission, but you also have to stay in line in the commission and also respect the rules of the commission. Though a lot of families oftentimes do things behind the other families' backs and they make sure they make sure that it's not tied directly to them so that the commission cannot prove this. The commission is most notably seen in the Godfather Part 1. In the Godfather Part 1, the Corleones meet with the Tatalia family, the Stracci, family, uh, the Cuneo family, uh, the Barzini family, and this was meant to resolve a dispute over the a war starting. There was the five families wars. Michael Corleone, the son of Vito Corleone, killed Salazzo in a meeting. Salazzo was basically a drug lord that was on the Tatalia family's payroll. And after Vito Corleone refused to go into business with him, he tried to have Vito Corleone killed so he would be replaced with Sonny, so that Sonny would do business with him. And this eventually led to a war after Michael Corleone had, had fled, and Sonny Corleone ended up killing the Tatalia, um, Don Tatalia's son, and then eventually what ended up happening was Sonny Corleone also died in that war where the Barzinis had tricked him and gunned him down in the toll booth. Now, uh, Vito Corleone set up the meeting with the commission just so he could end the war and also so that he could bring his son back. That was the whole purpose of meeting with the commission. But this, just because families are on the commission doesn't mean they're friends. They're still rivals. But the commission is just there set up just to resolve differences and to prevent a war from happening. And Pegorino believes that by getting on the commission that he this is going to elevate his families to a more prestigious level because he's going to gain more respect and more reputation which is technically true by getting on the commission he will be a more respected family and people will start taking him more seriously but there's a reason why he never gets on the commission now anyways let's start talking about pegarino here and his backstory so starting off, Jimmy Pegorino took over the Pegorino family after his father died. He mentions this in the first in his first mission, Pegorino's Pride. Tell me what's due to me. I've been waiting for this and working hard for this for years. All that ain't worth nothing without me. My old man, God rest his soul, didn't have the balls to bring the family to the level I got it to. I'm gonna get that seat because of what I done. 
Now, Pegorino says that his father didn't have the balls to get the family to the point to where it is now, but he kind of contradicts himself because he also says that the family has been shown no respect. Need respect when getting out on the street? Jesus! So if Pegorino had the balls to get the family to where it is now, wouldn't it have more respect? I think his father was a, a two-bit, small-time gangster, a nobody who people didn't take seriously. So he was probably just some small-time hood who did some stick-ups and bragged about how tough he was. But look at how old Pegorino is. He is 51 years old, and he's st still seen as a nobody. So why exactly? UL Paper says the Pegorinos are not a real family, when Nico says he is already working for one family. Malik, I want to introduce you to John Gravelli, head of the Gambetti family. He needs help. I'm already working for a mafia family. They're scum. The Pegorinos? They're not a family. Gravelli is the only man who can get what you need done. He's in Shotla Medical Center. Tell him he was sent by a mutual friend. He's expected. John Gravelli also makes fun of Pegorino. <sighs> Oh, so you're the one who's getting involved with that nonsense for my dear friend, James Pegorino. I don't know what Spare you're- Spare me, please. I'm an old man. I ain't got much time left. Our mutual friend told me everything. Thank you. It made me- <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. <sighs> Packy himself even says early in the story that the Pegorinos are just a bunch of Italian gangsters in Alderney. He doesn't even call them a family. Ancelotti's, huh? I can't tell all those Watt families apart. Ancelotti's, Gambinos, Pecorinos. It's the fucking Pegorinos, man. We're working for them. Pecorinos are type of cheese. Pegorinos is a bunch of Guido gangsters out of Alderney. They're all mafia, though? Of course they are. Cosa Nostra and all that shit. Our family used to be bigger than all them mafia families put together. Back in the day, that is. But notice what Packy says. They are a bunch of Italian gangsters in Alderney. But in that exact same mission, what does Packy and his crew say? So is you down, boy? Or is you out? Down for what? Down for robbing a thief. Robin Hood. Exactly. Robin fucking Hood. <laughs> Who are you going to rob? The fucking mafia, boy. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Is the money good? What's the risk? Well, the risk is we all die a very slow and painful oh. death. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and the money is good. Very good indeed. So you in, big guy? Or we're gonna have to kill you. Well, since you put it that way, I mean... Right, Good. all right, right. all right. Let's yeah, go. let's do this. They say they are robbing the Mafia. When they describe Pegorino, they don't call him a Mafia, just a bunch of Italian gangsters in Alderney. They are robbing the Ancelotti family, which is the weakest of the five main families in Liberty City, for the Pegorinos. Pegorino believes that by weak weakening the Ancelotti family, he has a chance of getting on the commission. But what's important here is that Packy doesn't refer to them as a real family. He sees them as stronger than the McCreary's, but doesn't see them as a big time family. And Nico, at the end of the game, in the revenge ending, says to Pegorino, everyone sees you as a joke just to get him angry before killing him. Screw you. What the fuck did she ever do to you? I wanted you, you immigrant dipshit. Big talk. You want to know something funny? Not really. The commission? The old families? I know some of those guys. And they thought you were a fat fucking joke. Whatever. A joke. <laughs> So why does no one respect the Pegorino family? You saw so many different characters that all think they are a joke, and all the other families think they are ones as well. There is a number of reasons the Pegorinos are seen as a joke. Let's start with the first reason. They aren't a Liberty City family. Alderney is not Liberty City. This is the uh, left side island. Alderney is actually a separate state, and it's based in the state of New Jersey, and Alderney City is based on Jersey City. This isn't the main reason, but it plays a small role. The five main families are centered in Liberty City, mostly in Algonquin. 
They aren't going to respect another wannabe family from Alderney, another state, and let them come into the commission. This is actually based directly on the conflict the Soprano family had with the Lubertazzi family. The Sopranos were a New Jersey mafia in the Sopranos TV show, while the Lubertazzi's were a New York family. The Sopranos heavily in influenced the mafias in GTA 4. Tony Soprano is actually what inspired Tony Cipriani in GTA 3 and Liberty City Stories, but the TV show has a massive influence on GTA 4. The Pegarino family is based mostly on the Soprano family, but there are some key differences. The similarities between the Pegarinos and the Sopranos is that they are both New Jersey or Alderney families. They both attempt to do business with New York or Liberty City families. The New York and Liberty City families look down on them. But there's a few differences. For one, Tony Soprano, the boss of the Soprano family, did not inherit the family from his father. While his father was the boss at one point, after his father passed away, Tony rose through the ranks of the Mafia and actually got into the Mafia by robbing their card game with his friends. His friend, Jackie Aprile, eventually rose to become boss and Tony became underboss and acting boss when Jackie became sick. Now, at one point, the feds were investigating the Soprano family, and Tony, to get attention off himself, decided to make his uncle the boss, who really wanted the position. Now, there was some conflict, and it gets much bigger in the show of his uncle later on, but the reason that Tony made his uncle the boss was because it was a power move. Just one thing. One thing. You know I can't be perceived to lose face, right? So. Bloomfield. And the paving union. It's my asking price. Congratulations. Notice how Tony asks his uncle for Bloomfield and the paving unions for his support. His uncle gladly accepts, but what he doesn't see here is that most of the captains already see Tony as the big boss. Tony got a good deal and got the heat off himself, and when the feds did an investigation, they concluded that his uncle was actually the boss, when in reality he wasn't. The point is, Pegarino doesn't have the smarts like Tony. He's that type of guy that wants all the attention for himself. He wants everyone to know verbally that he's the big bad boss. He doesn't realize the amount of heat that this will bring to him, which is one other reason the Liberty City family see him as a joke. Tony is also way more competent than Pegarino. While Tony does do stupid things in later seasons, he has a lot more smarts uh, and a higher IQ than Pegarino ever would. Now, going back to the Lupertazzi family in The Sopranos, while they do business with The Sopranos, what does Carmine, the boss of the family, say about them exactly? They recite that drink? No, you gotta give him some slack. He hasn't really been boss of a family very long. Family? I told you, they're a glorified crew. Whatever they are, Carmine, The Sopranos bring in a lot of cash. He says they are nothing but a glorified crew. He refers to them as a crew, not a family. That's extremely disrespectful, and shows that Carmine does not take the Sopranos seriously. The Pegarino family is seen the exact same way. Now, why does he call them a crew? A mafia family is made up of several crews. These crews work for the captains or the capital regimes, and the captains report directly to the boss. Let's take a look at the Ferrelli crime family tree, for example, here. Now, this is a, a chart that I actually created a few months back. You guys might remember. I used this chart for a few of my lore videos referencing the Ferrelli crime family, which the Ferrelli crime family arguably is the most powerful mafia in the 3D universe in the GTA games. This was you know, GTA 3, Vice City, San Andreas, uh, Liberty City Stories, and Vice City Stories. They were the most powerful in the 1980s in the 3D universe. And then ever since the events of Vice City, uh, they became, they went into a, just a, a downfall of just constantly losing power every few years, every game they had some kind of incident, and eventually the Leones became the most powerful mafia in the 3D universe. And I use these images from GTA Wiki, which I will link GTA Wiki uh, down below. GTA Wiki is, you know, a great source, um, and it provides a lot of good images of a lot of these characters too. Uh, but anyways, let's take, let's explain these mafia ranks here. And these are, these ranks are actually based on the real-life Italian mafia, so these ranks are used in these games, but also this is actually the actual ranking system the Italian mafia uses in real life. Now, at the very bottom of the uh, ranking tree, we have associates. Associates are the lowest rank 
in the Italian mafia, and these are people that associate with the mafia. Now, associates, um, these guys, they can be very wealthy associates, like people that the mafia does a lot of business with, somebody maybe runs a chop shop, maybe runs some kind of business for the mafia, maybe like a casino that they have connections to, uh, but they're not a full member of the mafia. One of the main reasons that associates do, are not full members of the mafia is because associates, a lot of times, are not fully Italian. In order to be a member of the Italian mafia, you have to be mostly Italian. Very The vast majority of your background has to be Italian. If you are not completely Italian, you cannot ever become a made man, which is a full member of the mafia. So the mafia is a pretty racist system when it comes to their hierarchy. But as you can see, the associates that we have here, we had, you know, Mayor O'Hole, corrupt mayor in GTA um, Liberty City Stories on the Farley family's payroll. Barry, um, he was a corrupt uh, film director that had borrowed money from Giorgio Farrelly, associated with them also. Ken Rosenberg, their contact in Vice City, a lawyer down there. And now we're moving on to the next part. We got the soldiers. Soldiers are basically a full made men of the mafia. They're actual members of the mafia. Um, soldiers basically what it sounds like, a soldier. Uh, soldiers are typically people that the mafia will send over to get jobs done. So, uh, soldiers, a few soldiers might be part of a crew that report directly to the capo regime, which is the captain, and soldiers oftentimes will take low-level associates with them on jobs to take care of things. Now, an example of a soldier uh, might be like a hitman. It might be like a hitman that takes care of all the mafia's jobs. The full member of the mafia reports directly to the boss, the capos. When they need to get rid of somebody, they're going to call on the soldier. Tommy Versetti was the Ferrelli's main hitman in the 1970s. He was a, a made man, he was a soldier, and whenever Tommy Versetti, Tommy Versetti would be called to take somebody out, Sonny Ferrelli became jealous of his power, thought he was rising up through the ranks too quickly, and basically set him up where he killed all the people that were sent after him, but he got arrested, and then spent 15 years in the pri in prison, where you have the events of Vice City, and then you have Harry and Lee, they were two other soldiers that were sent with Tommy to do that drug deal at the beginning of Vice City. Now, how do I know Harry and Lee were soldiers also? Because the Mafia would not send um, associates to do a massive deal like that, like millions of dollars, these would be made men that are in their organization. Now, moving up, we got the couple regimes. Uh, couple regimes, uh, these guys are captains, and captains will typically run a specific part of the mafia's business. A captain could be in charge of a casino. Uh, they could be in charge of they could be in charge of mafia's prostitution ring. They could be in charge of other illegal rackets. The point is a captain is usually in charge of a specific part of the mafia's operations, and usually you don't have more than one captain involved in the exact same operation. So you have captains assigned to each operation that the mafia runs, and the cap the main purpose of the captains is to organize the soldiers that are in their crew and to help make money for the boss through the business that they are assigned to. That is the role of the captains. And then up there we have underboss. Underboss is basically like it's sounds underboss is second in command um you know, in that case, we had, you know, uh, Marco Ferrelli, who was the brother of Sonny. He became boss after Sonny Ferrelli was um, killed by Tommy Versetti. And the underboss basically keeps the captains in line for the boss. So he checks up on the captains, makes sure that the bo that the operations are running smoothly. And if the boss is away or in prison, um, the, uh, the underboss could be acting boss for some time. And then you have the boss, which the boss is basically the guy who runs the entire thing, basically king. He keeps the whole operation together. And then you have consigliere. Consigliere is a very high rank too, but it's a little bit underneath uh, underboss. Underboss is a little bit more powerful, but it is more powerful than the capital regimes. A consigliere is basically an advisor, an advisor to the Don. You know, somebody really close to the Don that the Don trusts heavily. This is going to be somebody that gives the the boss advice. Not typically the best person to be in a leadership position, but typically the person that has a secondhand opinion that gives the boss a different perspective on the situation and what the boss should be doing. That is what a, a consigliere does. But anyways, you know, these are all of these guys and the capital regimes that I didn't cover earlier. The capital regimes might. Mike Ferrelli, he dies in, in uh, GTA 3. He was a brother of Sonny Ferrelli. And you have Sonny Ferrelli's unnamed capo. He dies um, in Vice City. And then you have Franco Ferrelli. Franco Ferrelli is mentioned several times. Um, he is a capo. And eventually... Um, he becomes boss in 1998. He's killed by Tony Cipriani when he detonates that bomb at Fort Staunton, killing all the people. Uh, and Giorgio Ferrelli, it's unknown what rank he is, but I would... I would say that I'm 99% certain that Giorgio Ferrelli is a consigliere, which is the amount of power that he has. I think that Giorgio was very much a consigliere. Now, this is the Pegarino crime family. And if you notice, there's a huge difference here between the Pegarino family and the Ferrelli family. Let's just go back and forth a little bit here. Let's go back and forth. You see this? You already noticed this. The Ferrellis 
have way more higher up made men. The Pegarinos, on the other hand, they have so many associates. They have basically, you know, double the amount of associates that the Ferellis have. That's just absolutely insane that they have so many associates. And this isn't even all the associates. They have even more associates. All of those hired guns that Pegarino has, those are all associates. So these guys have literally like a hundred associates working for them, which could be an absolute disaster. And so you already see a massive red flag here. And for people wondering, Nico Bellic's an associate? Yes, he is. By Nico Bellic working for them, even if he, he's just a hired gun, he is still very much an associate. Johnny Clevitz is very much an associate also because he worked for Ray. He uh, he went to that diamond deal for Ray, so he is very much an associate. Uh, Packy and Gerald McCreary are also very much associates too uh, because they had uh, basically taken jobs for the Pecorino family. They associated with them, basically what an associate is and now you have way too many associates but then you you go up the line and you look at their soldiers and look at the soldiers we got anthony carrado which is pegarino's bodyguard we got marco uh Bonaro and p and peter um uh, marchetti which are soldiers too marco and pete these are the two guys that pegarino takes of him to meet the pavanos remember those guys and then we have another soldier we got luca Silvestri. And Luca Silvestri, he has two associates that work for him and report to him, and those those um, are John Barbosa and also Joe uh, DeLeo. Uh, these are the guys, remember, that operated the garbage truck, and they basically tried to rip Ray and Nico off. They tried to make off with the diamonds, and then Nico basically killed all of them off. And then look at Capo Regime. This is where the Pegarino family is just an absolute joke. The Pegarino family only has one Capo Regime, and that's Ray. What the hell? Seriously, only one. And Ray is a good earner. You know, Ray could is a scumbag. I will agree with that. But Ray knows what he's doing. Ray isn't an idiot. He might be a scumbag, but he's not an idiot. And even the stuff that happens to the Diamond deal, that's not Ray's fault entirely. The fault is actually Pegarino on here because Ray should have more help with this because Ray is in charge of all, the vast majority of these people. The vast majority of these associates and even these soldiers work directly for Ray. So Ray is only one guy that is managing all of these associates and these soldiers. That's just ridiculous. Even if you have a really smart guy operating that, that's just too much for just one guy to handle. So that's the problem with the Peg one problem with the Pegarino family right off the bat is that these guys don't have more captains. They need more captains to be able to run their operations smoothly. And for people wondering, why the hell is Phil an associate? Phil is basically like Pegarino's second in command. Well, Pe Phil is basically Pegarino's second in command in spirit, basically. Um, he does the vast majority of the work. He does basically just as much work as Ray does. Um, and Phil is way more honorable than Ray. But the thing about this is the reason that Phil is actually not promoted to the Pegarino family promoted in the Pegarino family is because of this. Listen to what Pegarino Phil's said. Phil's different. He's been my man for a while. I mean, how much can I do with a guy who ain't a full Italian? He's 90% Irish. It don't do too well for the reputation of us Pegarinos having St. Patrick that high up in our organization. It's, it's because Phil is 90% Irish. That's why he can't rise through the ranks. If Phil was, at, was mostly Italian, Phil would either be underboss or a capital regime alongside Ray. And Phil definitely has the qualifications to be, to be that. And Pegarino, I think, is making a massive mistake by not promoting Phil. It doesn't matter on this stupid, you know, tradition, you know, that every that they have to be 100% Italian. That's dumb. Uh, Phil should definitely be rosen through the ranks. You know, this is your best guy in the organization. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But look, Pegarino has no underboss. No underboss. Nobody. And he doesn't even have a consigliere. And Pegarino's death trap right here is that he has no consigliere. The consigliere is arguably the most important um, uh, role in the mafia except the boss. And the reason the consigliere is so important is because the consigliere is an advisor to the Don. The consigliere gives the Don a second perspective and advises the Don. Sometimes the Don will listen to the consigliere, sometimes the Don uh, won't listen to the consigliere. But regardless, the consigliere is there to give advice to the Don, to help the Don be able to run the organization as smoothly as possible. And Pegarino has no advice. He has nobody giving him advice on what to do. Pegarino thinks, I can do everything all on my own. I don't need any advice. This is kind of similar to Salvatore, where Salvatore Leone also has no consigliere. He also thinks that he can do everything on his own. But there's a big difference because Salvatore Leone has power. Salvatore Leone has wealth. Pegarino might have some wealth, but it's not comparable to Salvatore, and yet doesn't even have a 10% of the power that Salvatore had. So Salvatore was also making that mistake by not having a consigliere, but at least Salvatore was still very powerful, where Pegarino just isn't. And now take a look at this. 
I'm going to flip a, fl a slide here, and this is going to show everybody that basically betrayed the Pegarino family, and the people that betrayed the Pegarino family are going to light up orange right now. Take a look at this. Look. And this is just going back and forth just to show you guys how much of a disaster this is. You got five people in this mafia that basically betrayed it. You got Anthony, who ratted out the family. You got Luca, who uh, betrayed the family by stealing the diamonds. And you have Joe um, Joe DeLeo and also John Barbosa, who conspired with Luca to steal the diamonds. And on top of that, you also got Johnny Klebitz, who ripped them off and had basically made off with the cash during the diamond deal. So people are constantly screwing this family over. Now, why does this family have so many traitors? It's because Pegarino is bringing in way too many people. He's just hiring every single dumb person that he finds in the streets, and he's not checking these people. It's like, Pegarino needs more people in his organization, more capos to keep these guys under control, to keep these guys in check, to keep these guys in line. You got two made men who betrayed the family. You got Luca and Anthony, and, uh, the, and Marco and Pete, they were loyal to the family, but they were dumb. So this family needs to seriously be cleaned up. And this is one of the main reasons this family is just not taken seriously. They don't have enough hire people in the organization that are managing it. And they got way too many associates in, in, in the organization. It's basically just a mess to run this whole thing. And this is actually one of the reasons that this organization has so many legal problems. The reason they have so many fed problems where the police are constantly going after them is because of this. They got way too many people in the organization. If you got way too many people, you got way too many people that know too many things. And you, if you have so many associates that aren't made men and just so much dumb muscle, they don't really have a reason to be loyal to the organization, which is another reason why you have people that are ratting out the family. But we'll get to Anthony ratting out the family a little bit later on. Anyways, let's move on here. Now let's talk about Pegarino's big meeting with the Pavano family. The Pavanos are one of the five families in Liberty City. Why is Pegarino going to meet them? Well, listen to what he says in Pegarino's Pride. If the Pavanos is a Liberty City family, what are they doing coming out to Alderney for this meet? I let them operate out here from time to time. The Pavanos work a little shy business on this side of the West River. They also control a few bookies. I don't mind them taking a bite. I don't even make them give me a taste. Hopefully, they're gonna respect that when it comes time to ask them for a favor. You can't be too confident if you've got me here. Your insurance. I'm the captain of this ship because I look at every possibility. Check to make sure my ass is covered in each situation. I think about what's gonna happen if this guy screws me, if this one turns states, and so on. That's why you're the boss, boss. Shut up! Jesus, you're worse than my mother. Anyways, that's why Ray ain't ever gonna make it to the level he wants to reach. He's too busy thinking about himself. That diamond fuck up his case in point. I'm like a fucking chess player. You're covering me for six moves ahead when me and the Pavanos is just putting our first pawns out there on a checkerboard. Ah, huh, I like what you did there, Skip. Real clever. Can you do me a favor? Can you just shoot yourself to save me the trouble of doing it? Can you, Marco? Jesus! Notice how Pegarino says, I let them operate from time to time here, and hopefully they will remember that when I'm trying to get a spot in the commission. No, Pegarino, you don't let them operate out here. They operate out here regardless of whether you give them permission or not. They are on your territory and are doing what they want, a massive sign of disrespect. Let's take a look at a clip from The Sopranos and see how Tony handled it differently when John Sacramone, the underboss of the Lubertazzi family, moved into New Jersey. Skinny. Tony Soprano. This is for you, you piece of shit. Carmella's bringing something nice to the housewoman for Ginny. I didn't know you were moving to Jersey. Yeah, Ginny wanted to be uh, near her sisters, you know, and school's out here. And... We were sitting with Carmine all night long. You never once mentioned you bought a place in Jersey. Well, it's not Carmine's favorite subject, me living in Jersey. But it's what, half an hour, 40 minutes over the bridge? Well, why didn't you tell me you were moving here? Why? I gotta find out second hand. What the fuck do you care? What, are you working in the toll booth now? <laughs> Besides, they already got the condo in Point Pleasant. Yeah. You should have fucking told me. Oh, Tony, I'm telling you now. Uh, this is strictly a place for me to live. I got no intention of sticking my beak in. I mean, there's our family and... Then it's a Soprano family. Remember, this is a New York underboss that moved into his territory. While Tony and Johnny had somewhat good relations, they were still trying to play each other. 
Tony went over there with a gift, but was very assertive in why John had moved there, questioning him. John claimed he wasn't trying to stick his beak in, but that's exactly what he was doing. He was constantly interfering in the Soprano family's operations, and Tony saw it early on. Now, when it comes to Pegorino, he had an entire family operating in his backyard and did nothing about it. If the Pegorinos and Pavanos got into a war earlier, the five families really wouldn't do anything about it because the commission is meant to operate mostly in Liberty City. The, but the Pavanos moved a lot of their operations over to Alderney. Pegorino claims his muscle is stupid, but he's just as stupid. Listen to this. <laughs> That's just if the shit goes down, right boss? The Pavanos wouldn't fuck with you. Wake up, you fucking mook! Everybody's trying to fuck everybody! We're just hoping they got the manners to smile to our faces before they do it! You giving them a nice little offering, though, Skip? They ain't gonna turn up their noses at that! God, give me strength! It's like I'm dealing with children here! No wonder I ain't on the commission when my muscle is this stupid! He said, no wonder he's not on the commission when his muscle is this stupid, but he's an idiot as well. While Pegorino is right that everyone is trying to screw everyone, he's a fool for not seeing the, Pav the Pavanos have played him. The Pavanos, remember, are on his turf. He's not letting them operate, they are operating regardless of what he says. The Pavanos saw weakness, and so they exploited it. When Pegorino, what Pegorino should have done is demand attacks from the Pavanos. He should have told them, this isn't Liberty City, this is Alderney, and I run things here. If you want to operate here, you have to cut me in and pay a tax to me, otherwise we're going to have a problem. And there, those shouldn't just be empty threats. He should actively act on it if they refuse. Otherwise, he's a weakling. He thought that by sucking up the Pavanos, they were going to get all cozy with him and vouch for him. If, if the Pavanos actually stood up for him at the commission, they would be a laughing stock. Additionally, Pegorino should have been the one who chose the location for the meeting. Imagine this. You are calling a sit-down for a meeting with this family operating on your turf, and you're letting them choose the location? No, no, no. Pegorino should have been the one who chose the location for the sit-down. It should have been on his terms. You want to meet with me? You meet me here. We meet here where I want. Instead, he chose to meet the Pavanos in this abandoned industrial zone with barely any witnesses. It was a recipe for disaster. Even an idiot can see this was a setup from the start. The fact that Pegorino even went to that meeting also made the family see him as a joke. And notice what Pegorino says right here. The fucking Pavanos! If the rest of the commission knew they did this! I'm sure the whole city will be up in arms. The motherfuckers trying to whack me at a sit-down! He says if only the commission knew about this. There's no way the commission didn't hear about it. They just didn't care. Nigo even sarcastically says, I'm sure the whole city will be up in arms. Pegorino is so arrogant, he can't even tell Nico is being sarcastic. And what does Pegorino say during the chase? All right, let's get these slime ball bastards. People like that give Italians a bad day. Whatever happened to the honored society and all that shit? Can't say I know. I didn't even say the fucking capo. This is a declaration of war. The Pegorinos and the Favanos are hitting the mattresses. You heard it here first. I saw it through the scope on that rifle. We're gonna get that gift back and make this crew pay for their disrespect. Come on! They didn't even send a capo, a capo regime. And this is why, Pegorino, you are an idiot. They are going to meet you, the boss, and they did not even send a captain to meet with you. This is all a giant red flag. The Pavanos have set up the location, not you. They chose an abandoned industrial zone. They don't send a capo to even meet with you. This is screaming set up all over it. The fact that Pegorino could not see this coming is how stupid he is. He thinks that he's this big shot and they're not going to screw him over. The Pavanos have zero respect for him. Pegorino should have walked away the moment they didn't have a capo. In fact, he shouldn't have even gone to that meeting. It was pure stupidity. There's a reason the mission is called Pegorino's Pride. It's to show you he has so much pride and arrogance in himself. He thinks he's this big bad boss and everyone fears and respects him. But in reality, everyone sees him as a joke. And get this. After the shootout with the Pavanos, on both instances, the media does not even know who Pegorino is. Just look at this. Oil Terror Massacre. Police looking for a man with an accent. Terrorists have struck again. Police responded to reports of gunfire at the old oil refinery in the Actor Industrial Park in Alderney and found the bodies of several men. Most of the men were identified as known associates of the Pavano crime family, along with Pete Marchetti and Marco Bonaro, both from Alderney. 
a new spokesman said they are tr uh, treating this as an act of terrorism and do not see any significant organized crime link. The actor industrial park is full of sensitive equipment and volatile chemicals. The terrorists were probably scouting for a target when they ran into these mobsters. A gunfight ensured, and the terrorists fled the scene. A mobster is a patriot just like every other American. They were doing their duty for their country. Witnesses saw several cars fleeing the scene. One of them carried an injured person in the back seat. One man clearly had a foreign accent. So, they don't even know who Pegorino is. They clearly know who the Pavanos are, and don't even know what Marco and Pete's connection to this is. Terror in Alderney. Pavano crime family suspected. There has been yet another mass shooting in Alderney. Again, it involved members of the Pavano crime family, and again, the National Office of Security Enforcement is calling it an act of terror. Whether this is an act... Uh, act against Otto Erotikar, the retailer where the shooting took place, or the mobsters who were slaughtered, News uh, would not say. However, they have stated that several suspects have been airlifted from Liberty City to an offshore questioning center. These massacres have changed the spirit of Alderney forever. No more will that patch of land on the other side of, of, of the West River be associated with the good working class values, polluted swamps, spray on tans, big hair, violent racist masculinity, and other American as apple pie attitudes of the suburbs. Maybe it's time to think about blocking the booth tunnel once and for all. So, this, again, Pavano crime family suspected, but Pegorino was not even mentioned in this. And while it's good that you're not in the media, at the same time is they don't even know who he is. The media knows they are Pavano associates. They even think Marco and Pete were Pavanos. While not having media attention is a good thing generally for a family, uh, the point here is that Pegorino is a nobody. Now, there's a difference between what you know and what you can prove. For example, everyone knows that John Gravelli is the most powerful mafia boss in Liberty City, head of the Gambetti crime family. Even Roman knows this. And let me show you guys something, because there's actually a phone call that you can have with Roman, I believe, after the first Gravelli mission. Let's see if he picks up. Roman, how are you? Fantastic, cousin. Mallory is going to make me the happiest groom on earth. How are you? Good. I feel like I'm getting close. I've been working for John Gravelli. John Gravelli? The head of the Gambetti crime family? Shit, Nico. This man is very dangerous. This man is nearly dead, cousin. He knows the government agent that Michelle forced me to work for. They say they will give me Darko. You don't know how long I've waited for this, Roman. It is nearly over. Don't get ahead of yourself, Nico. Be careful around these men. Talk to you soon. Okay, I think we can call Roman. Um. Nico, my cousin, give me some tales of the Liberty City underworld. I'm curious. Maybe if you give me tales of a womanizing gambling addict. That's <laughs> a low blow and be. Seriously, what are you up to at the moment? I've been working for Jimmy Pegorino, the head of that Alderney Guido family. Yeah, the head of the family. Is he a big-time gangster like in the movies then? Wants to be. Keeps talking about being powerful. About getting on the commission with the five big families. I just hope he's got enough power to be able to find Darko Brevich for me. I hope you'll be able to relax when you do finally find him, Nico. Speak soon. I can't believe that Pavanos would treat me like this! The Pegorino name should mean something to them! It means something in Alderney! Even if it don't in Algonquin, they better not think of crossing that West River and not looking over their shoulders! Now, going back to what you know and what you can prove, can you prove it? Let's take a look at both Pegorino and John Gravelli's criminal records right here. So let's start right here, Pegorino's criminal record. This is from the Liberty City P Police Database. So Pegorino, Jimmy Peg, uh, 51 years old, Alderney City. Look at that, 1973, Grand Theft Auto, that's stealing a car. 1974, possession of stolen property. 1976, armed robbery. 1979, Grand Larceny, making off of a ton of money. Um, 1981, promoting gambling. 1985, hijacking. 1988, manslaughter. Manslaughter is when you kill somebody, but you didn't plan on it. It can be just a spur-of-the-moment killing. Uh, 2005, racketeering. Racketeering can fall under a number of charges, um, uh, usually involved in some form of extortion. Um, head of the previously small-time Alderney-based Pegorino crime syndicate, which he took over from his father. So again, he inherited the family. And it says even the police are considering them small-time. Attempting to control rackets being run by the five Algonquin families, but his power is questioned 
questionable. Main associates are Phil Bell and Ray Bacino. Ties to Irish-American hoods such as Gerald McCreary and Dukes. Lives in Alderney with his wife, Angie. Owns the Honkers Gentleman Club in Tudor. So, feds, they don't really take um, Pegarino seriously here. Um, you know, they're obviously going after him, but they don't see him as some kind of, you know, giant mob boss. And you can notice that if you just look at the years, 1973, 1974, 1976, uh, 1979, 1981, 1985, 1988. So, Pegarino has had legal problems every couple years. Every couple years, he's had some kind of legal problems. And then he didn't have um, legal problems until 2005. Maybe he kind of cleaned up his act act at that point he didn't have any kind of legal problems for 17 years but still this amount of legal problems in just a short such a short amount of time and now we look at Gravelli um John so let's take a look at him right here uh Gravelli John 85 Metal Hills Liberty City reason it says it's deceased is because he dies after his final mission he passes away in the hospital but um uh, it says 1940 possession of gambling records 1942 promoting gambling uh 1942 assault 1944 grand theft auto uh 1946 attempted m murder and we can tell that he didn't get charged with that because he was uh, charged 1949 with bribery and then look Look, this is what is really important. There's a massive gap right here between 1949 and 1990. That right there is 41 years. 41 years of not getting charged with any kind of crime because Gravelli was very smart and he covered his tracks. He wasn't charged until 1990, racketeering and murder, and he didn't get convicted on that. Obstruction of justice, again, and then 2006. So that was um, 14 years later, again, he wasn't uh, uh, charged with something. Head of the Gambetti Crime Syndicate since the death of Sonny um, uh, uh, Can uh, Cangellarosi in 1978. Indicted several times, but never convicted of a serious crime. Resident of the Schottler Medical Center for the last three years due to an allegedly serious illness. And here I will have both of their criminal records side by side just so you can take a look at that. But look, you can see Pegarino has had way more legal problems in just a short amount of time where Gravelli had some legal problems, but then he cleaned up his act and he didn't face any kind of legal problems for 41 years. 41 years being the most powerful mob boss in the country, and he did not face any kind of legal problems in that 41-year period, and he was not even convicted on any of these serious charges, which is what his record says. Pegarino's record doesn't say that he avoided conviction, so Pegarino actually spent some time inside, where it doesn't look like Gravelli has ever been convicted of any kind of serious crime. It's because Gravelli is smart in the way he goes about business. He takes a more subtle, cautious approach. He knows what he's doing. He doesn't draw so much attention to himself, or Pegarino wants to draw all the attention to himself. I'm the big bad boss. I do whatever I want to do. Respect me. Of course, it's going to draw attention to yourself. It's There's a difference between being respected, having reputation on the streets. Gravelli has reputation. People know who he is, but the feds can't prove it. Pegarino, on the other hand, the feds don't see him as a small time, don't, don't see him as a big time gangster. They see him as small time, yet they can prove it. They can prove that he's a gangster and they can prove it. So that's the difference between the two of them, is that Gravelli definitely knows what he's doing and isn't an idiot when it comes to managing his criminal empire. And what about Pegarino's treatment of his men? He treats his men like garbage. You guys all friends now? Nice. You best hope you made a good first impression on Nico, boys. He's gonna be the one looking out for you, darn that's me. Well, he's being paid to look out for me, so saving you guys' asses will be overtime. I can't believe that Pavanos would treat me like this. The Pegarino name should mean something to them. It means something in Alden, eh? Even if it don't in Algonquin. They better not think of crossing that West River and not looking over their shoulders. Too bad about Marco and Pete. Marco and Pete? Oh, yeah. Those guys didn't make it, did they? Well, too fucking bad. They knew what they were signed on for. Weren't complaining on their way out, were they? No, they weren't. Happy to be on board with the skipper. Yeah, well, they seemed like good kids. Ah, these kids come and go. It ain't worth paying attention to them until they prove they can survive. I just move on and hire some wannabe wise guys off the street. It's that simple? Has to be. I only start paying attention to my crew when they start putting me in an awkward position, either because they know too much in my rat, or because they got too much power and they're too smart to get themselves clipped. Nico seems to care more for Marco and Pete than Pegarino ever did. 
Marco and Pete might have been dumb, but they had a very important trait in them, and that's what, something that not a lot of people in the Mafia have, and that's loyalty. Marco and Pete were loyal to Pegorino. They gave their lives for Pegorino, and what does Pegorino do? He can't even say anything nice about them after they died, instead blaming them. He says they knew what they signed up for, they did know what they signed up for, but it doesn't change the fact that you got them killed. If you weren't such an idiot and met with the Pavanos, Marco and Pete would still be alive. A good leader understands that he is responsible for the lives of his men, and if Nico wasn't there, Pegorino, like the idiot he was, would have been clipped as well. And notice what Pegorino says about hiring muscle. He claims that he hires any wise guys off the streets. While most of these guys would be associates, this is still risky. Even bringing in some unknown associate can be risky to the family if they find out too much. This makes it very easy for them to get rat rats in, in on the family. You should ha only bring in people who you know are reliable and who you trust, not just hiring every dumb muscle in the streets. This is actually the reason why Pegorino has so many legal problems later on, because he brings in so, so much dumb muscle from the streets, treats them with no respect, has them be close to him, and talks business in front of, of them. When his guys get caught, they are more likely to rat, because why should they s sit in prison for an idiot boss that treats them with no respect? It's no wonder they might squeal. Police are all over us. Maybe you heard, I got served papers today. Phil yesterday. We got a couple of boys in jail. I think they might squeal. Somebody's talking. Wants us out of the picture. Maybe John Gravelli, or them Ancelotti's. Somebody got to my people! So what are you going to do about it? I don't know! I gotta shut someone up and show people I mean business! And what about Anthony? Not you as well! Tell me it ain't you as well, hey, you hey, Slavic hey. fuck! What are you talking about? Speak, you Balkan piece of shit! I'm done with you! Done with everyone! I'll go, but I ain't going quietly! Mr. Pegorino, I don't know what you're talking about. I came as quickly as I could. Fucking Anthony! What about Anthony? He was wearing a fucking wire! <sighs> that is a problem. My personal bodyguard wearing a wire! I raised that kid like he was my own! I beat him like he was my own son! When my son killed himself, Anthony became my son! Now this! The world is a cunt! Where is Anthony? Uh, I heard he's wearing a wire, so I freak out. I call him up. He's such a moron, he leaves his cell phone on. So we speak. After he's gone states, of course. I mean, Jesus. What a chump! <laughs> he freaks out on the phone, and I put the fear of God in him. I think maybe I've talked him out of it. Then, he has a goddamn heart attack on the phone. I'm thinking problem solved. He's dying right in front of my ears. But the asshole lived, and now he's in the Leftwood Hospital under heavy guard. Okay, okay. Of course, he's got you on the fucking tape, too. Of course. So you'll do this for me. So you want me to talk to him? I want you to whack him. And after that, I want you to kill all the other rats I surround myself okay. with. Okay, okay, don't worry. <sighs> Pegorino's son killed himself for unknown reasons. It's speculated that Pegorino possibly abused his son because he claims that he beat Anthony like he was his own son. Why would you uh, brag about beating up your own son? Remember, Pegorino treated Anthony like crap and even joked about having him killed. Hey! Hey! Is Mr. Pegorino around? Uh, uh sure. I I'll get him. Boss! Anthony, will you shut up? In fact, will you fuck off? Go on, get out of here. Mm -hmm. Don't come back till you get a brain implant or something. I'm sorry, I I'm s Nice to see you, Nico. You too. I got a couple of things I want to talk to you about. First up, can you kill this shithead? Sure. <laughs> Second, come in here. Oh, fuck. Pegorino was an idiot because he loudly talked family business when Anthony was outside and in his house. It's very stupid for a mafia family to talk business in their homes because their homes may be bugged. Let's go back to the Sopranos again and see how Tony handled a rat situation much better. You got a problem. Yeah, I know. I'm working on it. Working on what? Why, what were you gonna say? You better lay low with that safe house money. What are you talking about? 
They were asking me a lot of questions in there, you know? If I knew anything about the dead Colombian and the apartment and all that. So, uh, what are you gonna do about the Colombian money? They were putting the screws to me like I was a school kid, telling me that the money was marked. They even said that there's a new fingerprint technique that lifts it right off the bills. You're a lucky man, Jimmy. What do you mean? Well, you're out on bail on that conspiracy thing, right? Yes, so? It's only lucky prick like you would get pinched with a gun while he's out on bail for something else and still be out in time for dinner. Ironically, this rat's name is Jimmy, but Tony would refuse to talk business in the house's uh, main floor, instead going down to the basement where there's less of a chance of a listening device being present. Basically what happened in this show is that Jimmy had been arrested along with another one of his friends, Salvatore. Now Salvatore bon, uh, Bonpensiero was the illegitimate father of Joey LaRocca, the guy who plays in the Sopranos video game. That's another character, but Tony suspected he was a rat, but refused to believe it because he was such a good friend of his. As for Jimmy though, Tony and him weren't that close, but it's the fact that Jimmy starts asking Tony questions to things he already knows the answer to. He asks questions about their operation because he's wearing a wire. Tony refuses to answer, giving vague responses, and then mocks Jimmy, telling him that he's a lucky guy. When Tony sits down later on uh, with Jimmy and the rest of the family, they are aware he's a possible rat, and Jimmy keeps asking questions he already knows the answers to. The entire family is convinced that Jimmy is a rat. Jimmy is lured to a hotel with the promise of hookers and killed. Tony handled that situation way better than Pegarino. What does Pegarino do right away when he finds out that Anthony is wearing a wire? He calls him and tells him, I know you are wearing a wire. I mean, how stupid can you be? You know this guy is wearing a wire and you decide to call him telling him that you know he's wearing a wire. Complete stupidity. What Pegarino should have done is acted like everything was normal, everything was cool, pretended to go on some trip, bring Anthony as backup, and have him killed and disposed of where the body would never be found. The ideal situation would have been to have Anthony refuse to testify, which it looks like he is willing to when Nico sees him. The patient's back there, Doc. Look after him. Can I have some time alone with my patient? You can have one minute. Boss? Peg, is that you? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, shit, Nico. You here to see the boss? It's just this way. Uh, wait, isn't the boss in jail? Uh, what are you here for? Ah, uh, shit. I didn't have a choice. They were gonna put me away for some hard time. Uh, I never thought it'd be me that turned rat. Go to sleep, Anthony. You look tired. Tell... Peg... Uh, I'm sorry. The Don't witness is down! Oh, stop! Ass. However, the situation is too risky at this point. Anthony can switch back at any moment and knows too much. The reason the feds were all up in Pegarino's business was because he had Nico shoot up a hospital and kill a witness under federal protection. Even if you do the stealth approach where you dress up as a doctor, you will still have the police detect you while you are leaving an open fire. Any family would have gotten more fed attention after that. Even if John Gravelli had a hospital shut up and kill a witness, the feds would still go after him even more. However, Gravelli wouldn't be that stupid that he would have a witness this being protected by the feds. Additionally, if we look at Anthony's criminal record, we can see that he was admitted to the hospital before, and this record is also before he was in there for witness protection. The feds believe that it was Pegarino that put him in the hospital for beating him up. The reason they can't prove it is because Anthony refuses to testify at that point. They also state that that it's because he is treated like crap, he is perfect for the witness protection program. It's Pegarino's own fault on why Anthony ratted on him. Perhaps treat your guys a little better, and this won't happen. The fed problem is also because of the heroin that Phil had Nico steal. Remember, Nico takes it to Frankie, Phil's nephew. Now this wasn't directly the fault of the Pegarinos, but more of the triads, because the heroin was already being watched. This was the same heroin that the Lost MC stole from the Angels of Death and gave it back to the Triads. After the Triads got gunned down by Nico, the feds knew the heroin was somewhere in the area, and because Frankie was a complete idiot watching it uh, over, they scoped the place out. Nico and Phil, they got chased by the feds, they almost got cornered by a helicopter, they killed several cops and agents. Of course, this will raise more police heat on them. Phil is also very smart about how he avoids wiretaps. Notice what Phil does here. Triads have this big chunk of brown they're desperate to get rid of. 
talking about it all over town, wanting to offload it at any price. They think it's cursed or something. Prove it is. Take it from them. It's loaded into a truck going to Franklin Street in West Dyke. Get a hold of it and give me a call. Sure. But Mr. Bell, it's going to cost you. You got it, no problem. Great. Say, nice stereo you got there, Phil. Thanks. Yeah, so, Philly, you ever hear from your ex-wife? <laughs> what kind of question is that? Just asking. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> Every time, this motherfucker. Mm. I remember when I was a kid, I was confused on why Phil went to the radio and turned it up. It was so that if there was any bugs recording him, it would be harder to get him on wiretap because the loud music sound would hide it. Phil also openly talks of Nico on how much rats are a problem. You scan this thing for bugs? No, but we can be pretty sure it's clean. Chill out. All right, all right. It's just that if we get caught on this one, you and me is going down for a long time. And that means that certain people is going to assume we're rat, which means we'll get whacked. You're working with the wrong people if you expect them to whack you if you go inside. Where's the trust, Phil? It's about survival. If someone who knew what I knew got flipped, then the whole organization will go down. Whacking someone who catches some heavy time is just an insurance policy. And it don't help that not everyone in the organization is pulling in the same direction. You mean that someone in the family would see someone else going inside as an opportunity to get ahead? You're a smart guy. Anyways, excuse me if I want to be absolutely sure that we got our asses covered. You're excused. What are we doing? Phil is aware of how much of a problem rats can be and is very paranoid about it, but Jimmy openly talks business in his house when it's probably filled with bugs. If you're wondering why Nico didn't get caught in those wiretaps, it's because UL Paper got rid of it for him, and Phil was too smart not to, to not talk any illegal activities, even in Pegorino's home. Now as for Ray, Ray's a scumbag, he's an opportunist, he tries to weasel his way to the top. Ray is basically a giant suck up to Pegorino and constantly talks crap about Phil to his back. See you later. Boss, gentlemen. You're only an associate, Phil. Remember that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, tough Boss, guy. I gotta tell you this. He's not straight. Right before I came in here, I saw him talking to Angie again. You better leave. Uh, I need to speak to Nico. Sure, boss. But, uh, think about what I said. I will. You know? Trust me on that. Now, Pegorino is a moron and is trying to figure out where the police problems are coming from. They are coming mostly from his stupid attacks. Remember, Pegorino hired the McCreary's to start a war between the Albanian um, gangs and the Ancelotti's who were using them as muscle. Nico had blown up a car that was driven by the Ancelotti's and killed them and all the Albanians. Then Nico whacked Frankie Garone and Ancelotti Capo. Remember, the feds arrested Jerry, so they probably had an idea he was working with the Pegorinos. Jerry didn't rat, but the feds figured it out. In fact, if we look at Jerry's police record, the feds know very well he is connected to the Pegorinos. The only reason Nico wasn't arrested was because UL Paper once again was protecting him. So basically, Pegorino had gone too loud. He had Phil and Nico steal a ton of cocaine from the Russian Mafia, he had Jerry start a war with the Ancelotti's, and he had Nico shoot up a hospital to kill a federal informant. Of course the police are going to be going after you, but what does Pegorino think about all this? The police are all over us. Maybe you heard, I got served papers today. Phil yesterday. We got a couple of boys in jail. I think they might squeal. Somebody's talking. Wants us out of the picture. Maybe John Gravelli. Or them Ancelotti's. Somebody got to my people. So what are you going to do about it? I don't know. I gotta shut someone up and show people I mean business. I've known Phil a long time. He's straight, more or less. I know him and Angie are friends, but that don't worry me too much. Hmm. Maybe he's too straight. Then there's Ray. Hmm. I don't know. I don't trust him. But he's a good earner. Notice how Nico's like, oh my god. I eye on the big prize. But he's no dummy. Him and Phil hate each other. I gotta think about it. Okay. I'll give you a call. Whoever I say to go see, go see him. And shut him up! 
He's too stupid to realize this, and instead he just blames rats. Remember, he just hires dumb muscle and treats them like crap. Of course they will rat. And the fact that he even considers Phil, his most loyal guy, shows how terrible his judgment is. Now, a few days later, what does Pegarino tell Nico? Nico, I've been thinking about it, and I want you to pay our friend Ray a bit. Give him a mess, give him a face. You gotta sit down on card row and eat up. If that's your decision, Mr. Pegarino, it's done. I see his car. He should be heading over to a chop shop in Boabo. Don't get too comfortable with him, Nico. Like every rat, he's a survivor. He's got good instincts. He has a bad feeling about you in particular. He bought some protection and he ain't gonna hang around and wait for you know what to happen. Then again, I'll get his chump muscle and stop for gas out of the way. It might create a good opportunity for you. That's right, he blames Ray, and he thinks that Ray is a rat. Now, I asked you guys in a poll if you think that Ray was a rat. The majority of you said no. Now, Ray is most likely not a rat. We don't know for certain. The reason he is suspected of being a rat is because he doesn't like to do the dirty work himself. He's extremely greedy and just a scumbag in general. However, even though Ray is scummy, he never betrays Nico. He does eventually help Nico find Florian, but it takes some pushing to do so. He gets betrayed by Luca's crew, the lost MC, and finally by Nico. Now, Pegarino claims that Ray um, hired help, but why did he? It's because he's paranoid of Pegarino screwing him. It doesn't mean he's a rat. Now, I will have an entire video dedicated to Ray and analyzing whether he was a rat or not. I promise I will have that in the future because I would spend another 30 minutes just talking about whether Ray was a rat. But to summarize it, there is no real evidence that Ray was a rat. Pegarino um, himself even says Ray is a, a great earner, and so does Phil. Problem. So you're a friend of Ray's? <laughs> a friend? Oh, I do some work for him. <laughs> oh, I mean a friend. I don't understand. Whatever you say, he's a slime ball, but uh, he pays. <laughs> sure, pal, sure. Listen to me. The thing about Ray is, he's a good earner. He talks a lot of shit, but he's a good earner. I mean, he's a rat doing an impression of a man. <laughs> That's pretty good. Ray was nothing to me until he started earning big and sticking his nose in places it didn't belong. Rats seem to get everywhere you don't want them to be. The only way you know is by finding their shit all over the place in the morning. But Pegarino also says Ray sticks his nose in places where it shouldn't be. That's true, but if he's not going against the family, you really should have no grounds to kill him. Ray Bacino uh, is most likely based on Ralph Cifaretto and the Soprano family. Now, Ralph is a massive scumbag, everybody hates him in the show, but he brings in a ton of money. Now, the scummiest thing that Ralph did in the Sopranos is when he murdered Tracy, a stripper who he got pregnant. Tony got really angry about it and put his hands on Ralph. You out of your fucking mind laying your hands on me! This is the boss of his family. Shut the Man, fuck up! I'm a made guy! Ralph claims he's a made guy, and actually Ralph is right in this situation according to Mafia rules. A made man is a full member of the Mafia. The boss can't put his hands on a made man or kill him unless he directly hurts the family. Tracy was not made, she was not related to any of the mobsters, as messed up as it was, Tony was morally right but wrong according to the Mafia rules. Tony later had to apologize to Ralph and promoted him to capo from Soldier. Later on, Tony does kill Ralph, not because of what he did to Tracy, but because he burned down a stable, um, killing a horse that Tony loved. Ralph did it for the insurance money. What he did was cruel, but it made the family money. That's the purpose of a Mafia family, to make the family money no matter how immoral it may be. It's to benefit the family, nothing else. In this case, Ralph did not do direct harm to the family. Tony had him killed, and even though Ralph deserved it, Tony couldn't admit to that, which is why he told the family that he thinks one of the New York families got Ralph. Now, the reason this is important um, going towards Ray is because there was no justification whatsoever to kill Ray off. Now, despite what you think, a mafia family is not a complete dictatorship. It's definitely not a democracy, but a boss can't just kill any made man he wants in his family. He can kill associates off whenever he wants, though there may be other issues with that later on. Um, but he can't just kill off a made man because he doesn't like him. This would put the boss in violation of the mafia's own rules. When Pegarino put his hands on Anthony, putting him in the hospital, he violated the mob's rules. When he killed off Ray, he violated the mob's rules. A made man can only be killed off when he is doing something wrong, like going against the family, not cutting the boss in, or ratting. 
the boss can't just kill off a made man because he doesn't simply like him. And in this case, Pegarino is claiming that Ray was a rat. But where's the proof? There really is none. The other families knew who Ray was. Ray spent his time in Algonquin making connections and making the Pegarinos money. He made them a ton of money with the meds he hijacked off the triads, uh, with Nico and Packy's help, and he was expanding his loan sharking into Algonquin. We never see Pegarino once in Algonquin, only when he kills Kate. The point is, Ray was out there getting things done, or at least trying. Ray's diamond plan wasn't a bad plan. What was bad was what Nico said here. They're gonna let us take the coke with this truck then, are they? That's the plan. Whether it works or not remains to be seen. You know something? I would've liked Ray to be on this job instead of me. But there's some things that he ain't trusted with. I don't think I'd trust him to send me on another job after the shit he had me doing. After all of that, you guys didn't even get the diamonds. That wasn't a successful operation by any way you look at it. I'm hoping that this endeavor is going to be more fruitful. For the record, I did everything I was meant to do. The problem was Ray's planning and the amount of people involved. Too many people wanted that dice. No one was ever going to end up with it. There was way too many people involved in the planning. There was too many people to control. The Lost, Luca's crew, the fact that the diamonds were already stolen from Bulgarin, and you had Gay Tony and Isaac's crew. It was a disaster. Information like that should have had way less people in on it. While Ray's plan to use the Lost wasn't bad, what was bad was that he brought them in on the deal. He should have had Nico go alone, maybe with some of his men, and given Johnny his cut after. But Ray tried at least. Ray learned from it and wouldn't make the mistake like that again. Now, Pegorino, in his not right mind, is convinced that Ray is somehow a rat. Again, there is no evidence, and he is one of the family's top earners. This will scare anyone else off from joining the Pegorinos, because one of their top earners, a captain and a made man, a high-ranking guy, got killed so easily off. The other family saw that and were disgusted by it. Even Phil, despite how much he hates Ray, probably thought it was a bad idea. It was just stupid. If you're gonna kill off a made man for being a rat, you need to be 100% sure like Tony was with Jimmy Altieri. He was pretty confident, but he also had Jimmy speak in front of the rest of the family to get their input. Now let's get back to Tony once again. Tony had another similar situation, but handled it much better than Pegorino. There's a conflict between Ralph and Polly. Polly was a capo or captain in the family who provided alarm codes to Ralph and his crew who pulled off a $100,000 heist. Now, Polly demanded 50%, which is a bit too high for just the alarm codes, but Ralph was trying to scam him, offering him only five grand. Tony told Ralph to give him 12 grand, which uh, was too little. Polly should have gotten probably around 20 to 25,000 instead of 12 grand. Now, what ends up happening later on is that Polly gets arrested on a separate incident. Tony does not bother to visit Polly in jail, and so he gets angry. Now, Polly's nephew is at dinner with the family. Ralph makes a joke about Ginny Sacrimoni's weight. Uh, this is John Sacrimoni's um, wife, the uh, underboss of the Lupertazzi family. Everyone laughs, including Tony. Uh, now, uh, Johnny at the same time kept calling Polly and asking him how he was in jail. And Johnny was only doing this to get info on the Soprano family. He was manipulating Polly. He wasn't being a friend of Polly just to manipulate him. And Polly actually told him about what had happened. Polly got really angry at Ralph screwing him and Tony not visiting him, so he told Johnny about the joke. Johnny gets furious and immediately beats up a Sopranos family associate who was working for Ralph. He then threatens to kill Ralph. This almost starts massive bad blood between the families. Carmine, the boss of the Lupertazzi family, even gives Tony the green light to kill John after John refuses to take an apology and the money. The reason is because Ralph makes Carmine a ton of money and through their partnership. Now remember what I said. A boss can't kill a made man unless he has a reason. John was threatening to kill Ralph and wasn't going to listen to reason. That gave Carmine, um, both Carmine and Tony Grounds, to kill John. In the end, it was dropped after John agreed to Ralph's apology. Now, going back to Polly, this incident caused Tony so many problems, and Polly ratted out the family. When most people think of ratting, they think of talking to the feds, but ratting could also be betraying your family to another family. If you gave in another family information on your family, knowing it would hurt them, you have betrayed their trust and could be hill killed, just like talking to the feds. Tony had 100% grounds to kill Polly at this point, but he didn't. Why? This is the reason. And when you went down below, I thought I saw a whale. Oh, shit. Made me think of Jenny Sack. <laughs> a joke, Ralph made about her that was some funny shit. No matter what John said. 
Gotta have a sense of humor, right? Yeah. Come on, you told John about that joke, right? It wasn't me, Tom. No? That's right. Tony took Polly out on his boat at sea. He looked at weapons on the ship and thought about killing him. He even joked with Polly, telling Polly, uh, come on, you told John about that joke, right? He wanted Polly to admit to it, thinking they were cool. But Polly uh, had survived decades in the Mafia. He isn't stupid. He knows the moment he admits to it, he's a dead man. So he lies to Tony. Tony gets really frustrated and throws a beer at Polly to scare him. That entire trip was a trip of intimidation. It was telling Polly, step out of line again and you're dead. The reason Tony, Tony ultimately did not kill Polly is because he was 95% certain that Polly told John, but not 100%. He needed to be 100% certain, but he wasn't, and so he couldn't kill him unless he was certain. We as the audience know Polly betrayed Tony, but Tony isn't 100% Sure. Tony, based on the evidence he had, did the right thing. He didn't whack him. And the thing is, Tony had way more suspicion that Polly betrayed him than Pegorino ever did that Ray betrayed him. He basically had Ray killed on nonsense and rumors. You can't do something like that. It's like Phil says, a family is supposed to have trust between each other. Shit, you seen any choppers? Any birds been in the sky? I didn't fit you for a helicopter enthusiast. Fuck you, I ain't. I just keep thinking these choppers is following me, that's all. The feds are watching my every move. I flip out even when I'm outside. Keep your head. Things ain't even started yet. What are we doing? Taking a shipment of coke from some Russians before they can sell it to the Ancelotti's. I'm paranoid because we especially don't want to get caught on this one. We get caught and everyone will be coming after us. The feds will throw away the key. The Russians and the enchiladas know we was fucking them over. Hell, our own family might come after us for fear we'll turn states. Hey man, this familiarity is getting to me. I'm a friend of Ray's. I'm part of the family. Shit, man, I'm just a hired help. I'm the fucking immigrant maid cleaning up your guy's shit. I ain't part of no family. I'm an independent contractor. Sure, sure, I get that. Whatever makes it all make sense in your head. Family's a way of saying we ain't gonna fuck each other. At least that's what it's meant to me. All I care about is that you're loyal enough to get the jobs done and not turn states. I'll get the jobs done if the money is there. And I ain't gonna turn states. Enough governments have let me down in the past. I don't know why I'd trust this one. That's the attitude. These guys promise you a new life if you screw every person who ever did a kind thing for you. Then they ship you off to Ohio and get you selling microwaves. There ain't no action, and the only cannolis you're gonna see are the ones on TV. It's all internet porn and dreaming about home. That ain't no life. Depends how you define life. Pegorino killing Ray destroyed any chances of him ever getting on the commission. And now what about Dimitri Raskolov? How is he involved in Pegorino's nonsense? Well, Dimitri first starts working with the Ancelotti's, and he is bringing in coke from Vice City and selling it to them. Rem remember that at this time in the story, the Ancelotti's lost their partnership with the Albanian Mafia due to Jerry and Nico. They were looking for other partners and found Dimitri. One of the other reasons that the Ancelotti's probably worked with Dimitri is because he was selling coke and heroin to them alongside Bulgarin. In the Ballad of Gay Tony, Rocco Pelosi, a soldier in the Ancelotti family, talks about the Russian Bulgarin. Whatever. It don't matter, right? What matters is the Russian has come to Mr. Ancelotti and said he wants the head of anyone involved with the diamonds. Now, on top of all that Gracie and chink shit, the old man is pissed. He wants blood. I the point here is that Bulgarin has some kind of connections to Don Ancelotti, and he might have pressured uh, Ancelotti into doing business with him and also with Dmitry Raskolov. Now, additionally, I want to comment another thing. on In Catch the Wave, Pegorino is a terrible tactician, and this shows why he desperately needs a consigliere, why he desperately needs somebody that's that's 
uh, that's going to give him advice, because he doesn't listen to Phil's advice. He thinks that his plan is going to work. Basically, what Pegorino's plan is, is to steal a truck from the Ancelotti, have Phil's guys steal a truck from the Ancelotti's that's supposed to be loaded with cocaine, and they're supposed to drive up to the Russian compound, and the Russian mobsters are going to put all the cocaine into the truck. But both Nico and Phil know that the plan is not going to work. This is coming. You're excused. What are we doing? We're taking a load of product off of some Russians the enchiladas have been dealing with. You was helping those Irish idiots cause some beef between the enchiladas and their Albanian muscle a while back. Since that little love affair ended, they've been getting this Russian guy to supply them with sea. We just got the heads up that a shipment has arrived in Liberty City by boat. That's what the talk about the ducks was. Exactly. We're taking the sea off the Russians so they can't deliver it to the enchiladas. Sounds straightforward. We take the coke so that the Russians and the Ancelotti's have a falling out. Then we make some money in the process by selling the stuff. Easy. Shit, you sound like you're saying all this just so it's clear on the wiretap. For the record, I don't know what this man is talking about. We're rehearsing a scene for an acting class. I work in waste management. Everything we're saying is fiction. It has no bearing in the real world. All right, this is the truck. Why we need this truck? There must be a shitload of coke we're taking. It should be a lot of sugar. But that ain't the only reason why we're taking this truck. Some of my boys stole it from the enchiladas this morning. It's the one the Russians are expecting to come pick up the seat. We should be able to turn up and have them load it up for us. Then we drive away, no questions asked. I don't know if anyone will give away a load of coke without asking any questions. Even the Russian coke runners ain't that stupid. Yeah, sure, this is just plan A. It's the one Jimmy P worked out. You and me know it ain't gonna work, and that the only way we're gonna be able to leave that place with the sugar is if all the Russians in there are dead. So why don't we use a more subtle approach? Not just drive right into the middle of it. Because these is the orders, and we gotta follow them. That's the way things work. You ain't gonna be happy about everything you get told to do, are you? You're the boss. It ain't like I'm working for free. No, you ain't, and I ain't neither. That's why we gotta at least try to do what we're told to do. You're gonna learn that there ain't much in this life that you got control of. Whether you're putting yourself in harm's way because that's the way the skipper wants it done, or you're staying away from your kids because of a stupid court order and a malicious bitch of an ex-wife, there ain't that much control in anything. I've been around long enough to know that there are some things that we don't have a choice about. But there's other times where you got to look at something and make a decision for yourself. I can't follow every order I'm giving. Yeah, well, maybe you're right. Maybe you ain't. I don't know. This shows what an idiot uh, Pegorino is. This is something that you hear about in movies. This is not going to work. Better approach would have been to sneak up on them and attack them, not drive in with the truck here. Pegorino nearly both got Phil and Nico killed, but Phil was still loyal enough to Pegorino to even follow his stupid plan despite how much he disagreed with it. The thing is, the Russian mafia is bringing the coke in, but how did the Pegorinos know about this? I can't believe I never saw this before, but it was probably Dimitri. Dimitri told Pegorino about the Russian Mafia bringing in the coke. Now you're probably wondering, why would Dimitri do this? Because he's playing triple sides. The Russians bringing in the coke were probably Bulgarin's men. I doubt that Dimitri would have connections going all the way down to Vice City. That's probably Bulgarin. The Ancelotti's already paid for the coke, so they just have to pick it up uh, in their truck. And Dimitri is getting paid by Pegorino for this information and getting in good graces with them, so he's playing everyone. The Ancelotti's got ripped off, Bulgarin was weakened, and Pegorino is now in favor of Dimitri, the next mafia he can manipulate. I mean, it's possible Phil got this information somewhere else, but I think it came from Dimitri to Pegorino. Now, afterwards, Nico destroys Dimitri's cocaine operations in Alderney. Nico also destroys the Russian Mafia's cocaine operations in Alderney, and the reason that the Ancelotti's cut ties Dimitri is because he's probably causing them way too many problems, and they might have pieced it together that he's screwing them. The only reason the Ancelotti's even consider doing business with him is because they are the weakest from the five main families. They are desperate for cash after that disaster with the Albanian Mafia. The reason that Gravelli and the other five families hated the Russian Mafia is because the Russian Mafia has no respect for the commission. They have no respect for the old ways, which is what Gravelli is talking about. Yes. Let me tell you, that friend of yours, Bernie Crane, his boyfriend, he's being blackmailed. By them damn Russians. They want him to put certain contracts up for tender. Windows, bus lines, cleaning, ones we control. These Russian fucking bastards are trying to finish us. What do you want me to do about it? 
I want you to work with me. In exchange for what? The police have a file on you an inch thick. In exchange for that. In exchange for that guy you've been asking about being brought here from wherever it is he's hiding, Switzerland or some shit. <sighs> okay, good. What do you want me to do? A good friend of mine is coming into town to give a speech on the new threat to Liberty City, Russian organized crime. I got a feeling some people ain't gonna want that speech to happen. Maybe the guy you love, this Dmitry Raskolov, has an interest in keeping the story out of the press. Make sure our boy gets to City Hall. <coughs> He's coming in from upstate. He'll be at Grand Eastern Terminal on Bismarck. <coughs> Thank you. In the commission, the five families outline territory and rackets that each family will control. The whole point of the commission is so that the five families can work together peacefully and resolve disputes without wars. Wars cost money and gets heat on them. The Russian Mafia has no respect for this system. If they want something, they will take it by force without consulting the other families. And the only reason Dmitry was able to do all of this unchecked was because of Bulgarin, who the other families are scared of. With the Russians, it's nothing but scaring, intimidation, and violence. While the five families in Liberty City do their fair share of violence and intimidation, it's a bit different here. The reason is because with the other families, you can make a deal, you can make arrangements, you can work something out, there is some common respect between the families. With the Russian Mafia, they don't care, it's constant betrayal and attacks. The Mafia, if they have someone important like Bobby Jefferson, they will pay them off. The Russians are just gonna kill everyone. And this is why Dmitri came into contact with Pegorino. Gravelli had it and gave Nico his blessing to destroy the Russian Mafia. The other families are scared of Gravelli, plus Dimitri's unpredictable nature and constant betrayal of others leads no one to working with him. No other family is going to work with him, he's too unpredictable. And here's the thing, Phil met with Dimitri off screen, Dimitri with his smooth talking easily won Pegorino over, but not Phil. It shows just how stupid Pegorino is for trying to have Nico go into the deal with Dimitri in the first place. Dimitri's giving the buyer the H while we pick up the money. We'll get a call from him when they have the stuff. Then the buyers will hand over the funds. Couldn't be simpler. How come everything we get into starts off simple and ends up real complicated? Well, at least I don't have to see that weasel Dimitri in the flesh. Yeah, I met him when Jimmy P set up the deal. There's something about him I don't trust. He ain't someone I'd work with more than once, no matter how much he's earning us. That's a smart move. I worked with him and he double-crossed me. Showed me out to someone I had history with. I nearly got killed. And I never thought I'd cooperate with him again. <laughs> Money makes people do the strangest things, don't it? This is just a straightforward money pickup. Dimitri is gonna hand over the H on his end, then we're gonna get a call saying we're good to go. They'll hand over the cash, and we're at it. I don't think anything is straightforward, especially when you've got a snake like Dmitry Raskolov working with you. Something didn't look right about him. I don't know, there was something in his eyes. If you thought that Ray was slippery, <laughs> Dmitry is a different level. At least you knew what Ray was after from day one. Dmitry can turn on his best friend in a second. So? Why are you working with him again? Sometimes it ain't worth sacrificing a paycheck for personal differences. I'm after the money, not revenge. Stay down! Don't make me sweat! Require... Uh... Mr. Pegorino, Phil didn't make it. He's in a better place. Shit! There's Phil! Anywhere would be a better place than being in my shoes right now. If I don't got Phil, I don't got much. I'm screwed! If Nico and Phil go to the deal, Dimitri screws them over. Now it's a bit confusing what happens here. Basically, Dimitri and Pegorino have the heroin in a partnership. The Pegorino sell the heroin for the Russian Mafia and get a cut of it. It's unknown who the buyer is. Some people speculate the buyer is the Ancelotti's because they have had they have similar model character models, but I highly doubt it's them. Because remember, the Gambetti family 
threatened to go to full-scale war with the Ancelotti's if they didn't stop working with the Russians. And on top of that, they would be doing a deal with the Pegarinos. The Pegarinos have no respect, and any family doing a deal with them would be a laughingstock. Plus, if Phil and Nico wiped out the Ancelotti's, they would know the Pegarinos did it and then come after them. The buyers are most likely some smaller level gang that's from out of town. What Dimitri did was he killed the buyer's representatives to screw over Phil and Nico who were in their compound. Now what happens at the end of the mission? Phil is furious and says he's never been put in a situation like this. We called it. Thank fucking God. That certainly wasn't simple. I just gotta get away from the cops. Dimitri, I ain't never been put in a situation like that before. I guess you get used to it when you hang around with him long enough. If they got tipped off before Dimitri called us, we would have been fucked. It would have been an execution. Dimitri likes to set up executions. He set up his best friend, Mikhail Faust. You gonna kill him then? No, it's over for me. I'm out. If I was going to kill him, I would have done that instead of this deal. Now I got the money and I'm going to forget all about this shit. Good luck to you, man. I hope it works out. And what about Pegarino's reaction? It's such a stupid one. They were somebody in the first place? I hope your partnership is a fruitful one. Good luck. Goodbye. You've been a useful set of hands. Look after yourself. So that shows you how much of an idiot Pegarino is. He's like, oh, this is perfect. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's perfect. It's the fact that Nico and Phil almost got killed. Dimitri has the horse and Phil is bringing me my cut of the action. This is perfect. No, it's not, you idiot. Two of your guys nearly died and your partner just screwed you over. He's a complete idiot and buffoon. Only an absolute idiot would think that this is somehow a win. It's not. It doesn't matter that you got the money. At least that's good, but it should have never gone down this way in the first place. This is why the other families don't want to work with Dimitri. And before we talk about Pegarino's fate, I want to talk about why Nico respects John Gravelli and doesn't respect Pegarino, despite knowing Gravelli for such a short of time. It's because the first time that Nico meets Pe Pegarino, he acts like a tough guy and tries to impress Nico, but he's a fool. Peg, what? Someone for you. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So, were you followed? I don't think so. Oh. I mean, who knows? Exactly. I mean, we can pretty much guarantee you were followed. The question is, did you know about it? And right now, I don't know the answer to that question. But to be honest, I don't really care neither. I know enough about you, your cousin, your friends. I know a lot of people around you end up in jail. Some maybe. But that's the same all over town. This is a dying game. I don't understand. I mean, I'm going to ask you to deal with a problem, and you're going to deal with it. Or you're not going to deal with it, and you're going to be a problem that somebody else has to deal with. But me? I ain't doing nothing. Yes, okay. So what's the problem? We'll get to that. Anthony! Yo! Did Phil call? Not yet, boss. Ray called. <sighs> of course he did. I wonder, is it better to have a talented snake? A historical lion who's going to be cut down in his prime. I don't know. What do you think? I don't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> you do. But I ain't going to push. Anthony, get in here. Boss? Where's Big Pete and Marco? On their way. <sighs> Listen to me. Here's what the plan is. Me and two of my guys... Gonna meet with a couple of boys from the Pavano family. I need these guys if we're ever gonna be taken serious. You know, get on the commission. Now the thing is, these guys ain't, shall we say, shown us the appropriate respect in the past. I want you to run security. Keep an eye on things, because they won't be looking out for you. Ah, here they are. It's either them or the cops. It's them. They're outside. Looks like Ray's here, too. I know it's them. God, give me strength. I'll be out in a minute. Look after Ray till I get back. Hey, Tone. Hey, Ray. I need to speak with Pegarino. Hey, what, what are you doing? He's, he's busy. Hey, Nico. <laughs> oh, boss, salve. Get up. I'm sorry, boss. This guy's everywhere like a freaking cockroach or something, huh? <laughs> 
in a good way. Ray, you and me is gonna talk. The boss has got business. Yeah. Uh, boss, I got you this because I care. You boys have fun. That entire speech was to make himself look smart, but he's dumb as hell. He's trying to act tough, and then Ray comes in and sucks up to him. I guarantee you Gravelli never acted like this towards guests in his home. Pegorino also constantly talks about how he will get on the commission and the respect he deserves. Respect is earned, not given. The other families don't respect Pegorino because he acts like a tough guy, but is a nobody. He's a joke. He even says they don't look at him like a real family. Well, he's not, and never has been, and never will be. So, listen, we got a bit of a problem with the Pavanos. Yes, I noticed that at your meeting with them. The way they look at us, we're bottom feeders. Always have been. We ain't a real family to them, just a bunch of Guernsey Goombas. When things are cool, we're getting fucked. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, sure. Listen, some of their boys are in town today. Gonna collect their piece of an old and a bookie ring. Where it is, they're at the diner and actor. Find them and follow them to the meet. You disrupt it, and I'll let you keep the money. But make sure you hit the Pavanos real hard, Gabish. Yeah, Gabish. <sighs> Thank you. I think that guy works for the Pegorinos. God, they must be desperate. Let's lose him on the way to the meet. Pegorino is such an idiot that he sends Nico a text message and even writes it under the boss. Excuse me, what the hell is this? Who writes something like this? It sounds like something a child would write. But now let's take a look at the first time that Nico actually meets John Gravelli. Look at how different it is to Pegorino's intro. Uh, uh, yeah. oh, so you're the one who's getting involved with that nonsense for my dear friend James Pegorino. I don't know what you Spare you're... me, please. I'm an old man. I ain't got much time left. Our mutual friend told me everything. Thank you. It made me... <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure. <laughs> People are so damn vain. Some people? <clears throat> All people. Even you, even me, an old man facing the end. And I still care. Care how I look. Care that when I shit myself, the pretty nurse has to clean it up. It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, well, uh, <sighs> you know. And I care about my legacy. I've worked hard for this, this line of work. Now some Russian assholes think they can march in and take control of rackets my family has run for 50 years! <laughs> you mean 50 years of you bleeding the city dry might finally come to an end? <laughs> I know, it's a terrible <laughs> tragedy. <laughs> But if it wasn't me, it would just be someone else. So it might as well be me. Yes. Let me tell you, that friend of yours, Bernie Crane, his boyfriend, he's being blackmailed by them damn Russians. They want him to put certain contracts up for tender. Windows, bus lines, cleaning, ones we control. These Russian fucking bastards are trying to finish us. What do you want me to do about it? I want you to work with me. In exchange for what? The police have a file on you an inch thick. In exchange for that. In exchange for that guy you've been asking about being brought here from wherever it is he's hiding, Switzerland or some shit. Okay, good. What do you want me to do? A good friend of mine is coming into town to give a speech on the new threat to Liberty City. Russian organized crime. I got a feeling some people ain't gonna want that speech to happen. Maybe the guy you love, this Dmitry Raskolov, has an interest in keeping this story out of the press. 
Make sure our boy gets to City Hall. <laughs> He's coming in from upstate. <sighs> He'll be at Grand Eastern Terminal on Bismarck. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Gravelli is very honest with Nico, and doesn't appear to scare him or any of that crap. In fact, he offers a deal to help him. When Nico tells him Bleeding the City Dry is going to come to an end, Gravelli is one of the few characters in the game who understands Nico's sarcasm and laughs with him. He's a scumbag, but at least he's straightforward. He doesn't BS. He admits he's a bad person and is straightforward with Nico. Now, if you notice, Nico respects people like this. There are three other characters that Nico despises besides Pegorino. One is Francis McCreary. The reason Nico hated him is because Francis Francis pretends to be a good person, constantly giving Nico lessons on how he's helping the city, when in reality all of these actions were just to help build his career. He hates Playboy X because he used Dwayne when Dwayne treated him like a son and then froze Dwayne away, showing no loyalty towards him. He hates Ray Bacino because of how slimy he is and the fact that it takes him so long to help. He constantly says, I'll take care of you, but never bothers to actually help until Nico threatens to walk out. And now remember what Pegorino told Nico. He told Nico, ambush the Pavanos, and I'll let you keep the cash. I'll let you keep the cash? Nico is the one who is attacking them. He's going to keep the cash regardless. And Pegorino's phone call afterwards shows just how scummy he is. I got that stuff, Jimmy. Well done, my boy. I hope you made him suffer. Teach him that more than he is Pegorino turf. Is there a nice little haul in it for you? All right. Well, maybe you'll give me a little taste and we'll hand something up the left. As I was Italian, we do doing things for centuries. Good thing I'm not Italian. Well, at least you will give me a taste. Us Italians have been doing that for years. It's until Nico shuts him down and tells him that he's not Italian. Pegorino should have never made that comment about wanting a taste after he told Nico he would let him keep the money. It shows that Pegorino has no respect for the guys he's work that, that are working for him. And as for John Gravelli, there is a massive difference in how he does business compared to Pegorino. Gravelli is a very powerful man, but how did he get there? The opposite of what Dimitri does. He respects and honors deal deals. Gravelli got to the top the same way that Don Corleone, the guy Godfather got to the top. Don Corleone got to the top because he refused payment when people wanted him to do something for them. Instead, he did favors. How it worked was if you came to the Don, he would do you a favor and he may reject or give you a different solution based on the, on the situation. In exchange, that person would owe their allegiance to the Don and when the Don needed a favor, he would come to that person and ask for a favor. It's a partnership, but it's supposed to be on equal footing. If you do a favor for the Don, he would never forget it and he would help you with what you needed help with. But asking for a favor and not helping the Don in return when he needs a favor can be a death sentence. Gravelli has also shown mercy in the past when he spared Don Ancelotti in the 1970s. He admits this to Nico. Everyone, now that you hear what I said. Yeah, I heard what you said. Nico, our friend here, is telling me that the Ancelottis are in league with the Russians. Ancelottis? I know these guys 73 years. In 1972, I should have killed his uncle, but I spared him. And this is how he repays me? Unbelievable! And now he's dealing drugs with Ivan the goddamn terrible! <laughs> so what we're saying is, this is a matter of security, national. Normally, I don't care about cocaine. Keeps controllable people in power, but this is no good. All right, what's my role in this? The distribution network is a fleet of vans parked at a grocery warehouse in Alderney City. The product is packed into the frames of the vans, ready to be moved all over the country. Destroy everything, whatever it takes. And for me? For you. I've got a real gift for you. Get this done, then we'll talk. <laughs> Gravelli is not a man without honor. If you do him a favor, he will do you a favor in return, even if he could easily screw you. He's a man of his word. At the end of the game, him and UL Paper could have easily screwed Nico, but he kept his word to Nico and even tells Nico he is glad to be able to help him find Darko Brevich. It was Gravelli most likely that pushed UL Paper to help Nico. He wanted to go out of this world knowing that he kept his word to everyone. And while mob bus bosses in general are scumbags, there are some that will absolutely keep their word as that means the most to them. Not every mob boss, but there are some that if you make a deal with them, they will honor it. 
For example, let's go back to The Godfather. At the start of the film, an undertaker comes to Don Corleone for help, saying that his daughter had been beaten up by her boyfriend and he wants vengeance. He offers to pay money. Don Corleone refuses to kill the uh, man because his daughter is still alive. This is most likely because Don Corleone knows a murder will generate way more heat than a brutal beating. In the video game, we see them actually scare the boyfriend and beat him up. The Undertaker is scared that Don will want him to cover up a murder, but in reality, he wants him three years later to make his son, Sonny, a presentable for the funeral so that his mother does not see him in such a terrible state after he got shot up by multiple machine guns. Another favor that Don did was he helped his godson get a movie role after the director refused to grant him it. It was because he was in a relationship with the actress the director wanted for himself. Don Corleone sent his consigliere over, and when he wouldn't listen to reason, had the director's horse killed and its head stuffed in his bed. A few years later, when Michael Corleone is the new Don, he remembers the favor that his father did for Johnny Fontaine, the actor. Michael tells him they are opening a casino, and they would like him to appear at the casino uh, for shows and invite his Hollywood friends. This would generate the casino tons of cash and entertainment. Johnny doesn't want to appear a few times a year for free, but he really has no choice because the Don did him a favor, made his career, and now he owes the Corleones. This is why if you ask for a favor from someone like Don Corleone or Gravelli, know they will help you, but you better be prepared to help them in the future when they ask for it. Let's go back to Bobby Jefferson now. The Remember that politician that Gravelli has Nico protect? Well, his speech is, is meant to be specifically against the Russian Mafia, but he doesn't say any, anything against the Italian Mafia. The speech is to get the feds after the Russians. But during the drive, before Nico and Bobby get ambushed by Dimitri, Bobby gives Gravelli a phone call. But there's something unique about the phone call. Unlike talking to other Mafia bosses, what is it? Hey, John! Oh, it's great to be back in Liberty City. I feel safe here when I know I've got your people looking out for me. Well, we both watch out for one another then. We wouldn't survive in this shitty world if we didn't. John, you sound terrible. Don't worry about me. You should be putting all your energy into getting better. Oh, that speech is fine, John. Before Mayor Ochoa knows it, half the LCPD will be learning Russian and patrolling Hove Beach. Don't mention it. Driver, why is this road closed? Is there a problem? Did you notice it? Bobby isn't scared of Gravelli. In his mind, he knows Gravelli is, a da is dangerous, and if he crosses him, he's dead. He knows his place, so he won't dare screw him, but he shows utmost respect for Gravelli, and also concern for his health, like he's talking to a friend. It's because Gravelli did him a favor, a massive favor for him in the past. We don't know what it was, but whatever it was, Bobby is deeply indebted to Gravelli, and has huge amounts of respect for him. That's why he is doing him this favor, going against the Russian Mafia, knowing it may be his end. But he's also confident, because he knows Gravelli's protecting him, and won't let harm come to him. That's why he sent him Nico, and Gravelli mentions more people. It's all about problems and solutions. Ah, yeah. Nico! Of course, you guys already know each other. Nico, good to see you. Interesting friendships you both keep. Yeah, very interesting. The mayor will be here in a minute, and I have two senators dropping by later. Everyone wants to pay homage to a dying legend. Everyone wants the glamour of a bygone age. The mayor, senator, celebrities, all of these people have some form of power, and Gravelli did them favors in the past, so they did some favors for him as well. Being friends with all of these people is the main reason Gravelli stayed out of prison for decades. Gravelli has a massive amount of reputation. Everyone knows him. They know he's a man of his word. They know how powerful he is. But if you do right by Gravelli and you help him out, you have nothing to fear from him. He built a massive amount of loyalty because of that. And this is why Gravelli has reputation, but not notoriety. Where Pegorino has no reputation, but a tons of notoriety. The difference is that Gravelli is well known and respected, but people can't prove anything on him and he's too powerful to arrest. While Pegorino has no reputation, is a nobody and is best friends of the feds because he's constantly making enemies and doesn't know how to make connections. For example, in The Godfather Part 2, 
There is a flashback to Vito when he was younger. His wife begged him for help, telling him that her best friend will get evicted by the greedy landlord. Vito tries to talk to the landlord and gives him a very reasonable offer. The landlord refuses to change his mind, mocking Vito. But what would Pegarino do in this situation? Pegarino probably wouldn't uh, help his wife with a situation like this in the first place. He actually admits to cheating on her when Vito never did something like that. My wife Angie's gonna love this. She keeps busting my balls about trying to get on a commission. Ask me why it matters. Women just don't understand this life of ours. Shit. Sometimes I wish she'd just run off with some other guy. Leave me in peace. You can't be serious. It ain't like she's my only woman. I got a nice little guma set up in an apartment and acting. That little holler keeps me young. I'll tell you that. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like I'm having a heart attack with that girl. Yeah, but the wife is a wife. I guess it's like with my cousin. He puts me in so much shit, gets us into debt, and it's some heavy shit with people, but, uh, he's family. I wouldn't have him any other way. That's some real sweet shit. You're bringing a tear to my eye. Of course I wouldn't let some guy ball a mother of my children. i cut his cock off and shove it down his throat. When I say I wish she'd run off with another guy, it's a figure of speech. His daddy. No matter how long you've been around, you ain't gonna speak perfect, are you? I guess not. Lucky I have people like you to teach me when I'm wrong. Yeah, even if you can't speak right, at least you can shoot straight. I can't imagine Gravelli cheating on his wife either, but if Pegarino was in this situation, he wouldn't even offer money and try to calm things down. He would just say, do you know who you're talking to? I'm the boss, and I do what I say goes. Whatever I say goes here, I'm the boss. Vito takes a different approach. He lets the streets speak for him. He never directly threatens the landlord, but he tells him, just ask around town about me. The landlord talked to some people in the neighborhood who told him he's the biggest mafia boss here. Vito put fear in his head without threatening him. The landlord then comes back begging for forgiveness, gives him the money uh, back, and offers to cancel the rent. V Vito never needed to say who he was because he let his own reputation speak for himself. Where Pegarino, it's always, I'm the boss, I'm so powerful, blah blah blah. Mafia families don't respect what you say, they respect what you do. You can talk all you want, but if you can't back it up, you're garbage, you're nothing. In fact, Pegarino is more like Don Finucci. He was a Don that went around the neighborhood before Vito came to power. He constantly e e extorted people and talked tough. People were scared of him and paid up, but Vito noticed he never had anything to back it up with. He dressed all fancy, which scared people, but he put two and two together and realized he was a nobody. Don Finucci threatened Vito and his friends to give him a cut of their robberies, but Vito only went with a fraction of the money to him. Don Finucci told him he had guts and offered him work. He didn't retaliate. Vito realized his words are empty and he can't do anything. That's when Vito decided to kill him and take his place. Pegarino is this guy, a guy who acts tough, dresses nicely, but is a nobody. The only difference between him and Pegarino is that he had somewhat more competent people near him, like Ray and Phil, but in the end, he's still a nobody, just like Don Finucci. Now let's talk about Pegarino's fate. At the end of the game, he tells Nico to do one last favor for him, a deal with Dmitry Raskolov. Brooks. Nico, uh, good to see you. And you, how are you? Uh-uh, fucking terrible. We got legal problems, all kinds of crap. You know how things have gone. I've heard some things. <sighs> you get close to your dream, then something holds you back. No. Well, commission or no commission, I ain't gonna starve. People don't want me around, they don't have to have me. I know how to earn. I need a favor. Here we go. Fuck you. I looked out for you. And I'll pay good, real good. But I need you to do something. I need you to collect that H. I got some Russians who have a buyer. Russians? Yeah. Dmitry Raskolov. No, we've got the history. I know. But this is real. I need you. Real? What the fuck is real? Real because it's you? Real because it's my last chance! Then good luck. No! I need you to get that H. 
I need the money. I looked out for you. You know, people wanted to whack you. I said no. Now I need you. And I'll pay a lot of money. Listen, Mr. Pegorino. I already told you. I got no, history. No, you listen, you dumb immigrant fuck. I ain't asking you. I'm telling you, do this. Get over your principles. These guys don't hold grudges. Do it or you and me are gonna have a problem. Look, Phil will look after you. You won't even have to deal with the fucking Russians. He's waiting for you, down in Tudor. All right. I knew I could count on you. Hey, how about that drink? Nico, for obvious reasons, does not want to work with Dmitry Raskolov again, and notice that when Nico says we have history, Pegorino says, I know. Again, Pegorino did not listen to Nico. Nico bailed him out and saved him several times from rats and the Pavanos. The least that Pegorino could have done is sat down with Nico after everything Nico did for him. He at least owes him a sit down. Pegorino should have sat down with Nico and asked him, what happened between you guys exactly? Why don't you trust him? And I'm sure Nico would have been glad to explain the situation. Remember, Phil also did not trust Dimitri, and I'm sure he told Pegorino about this, but he didn't listen to him either. If Ray was still alive, he would have also felt something was off about Dimitri. One of Pegorino's biggest problems is his narcissism. He refuses to listen to anyone, even people close to him. And again, remember, Dimitri screws Nico and Phil over. And Pegorino celebrates it saying Dimitri has the heroin and he has the cash like it's somehow a win. Two of your guys got betrayed by your business partner. What kind of moron are you? Nico tells Pegorino he's out and Pegorino tells him to look after himself. Now we know what happens next in the deal ending. Dimitri sends a hitman to Roman's wedding and Roman dies as a result of, of it. Now here's the question. Did Pegorino know that Dimitri was going to try to have Nico killed? The answer is yes. Little Jacob confirms it to Nico during a Revengers tragedy. I did not forget about this, but I let it slide in the interest of business. Sending an assassin after me and killing Roman on his wedding day. This is something I will not ignore. True, my brother. True. I ain't going to let it go neither. I want to get them bomb my crowd, them turn up. Them boys don't know right enough. Come in that church and come kill a man for them wedding day. John wedding day, right? Dimitri and Tegorino will find this out as well. They will find it out when they stale down the barrel of my gun. Yo, Nick, why you need to lose some of this anger you now before you go after them wide? Your man. It took me over. I cannot allow that to happen again. Not to me, not to Mallory, but everyone who loved Roman. We must find Dimitri and Pegorino and end all this. So not only was Pegorino stupid for working with Dimitri and disregarding both Phil and Nico's advice, but he betrays Nico right when he starts a partnership with Dimitri. Pegorino sold Nico out to somebody he barely knew. All he cared about was his image and being on top that he didn't bother to look into the guy he was working with, and he deserved what he got in the end. What's the problem? Me and you's partners now. We're back on top. I didn't work this hard to share the spoils of a victory. Goodbye. So you see that? Dimitri betrayed Pegorino, just like Dimitri, he betrays everyone. You and me is gonna end this. You're a piece of fucking shit! You work with a snake, you get bit by the snake. The moral lesson here was to never work with somebody who has betrayed you again. There's a reason no other family at this point wanted to work with Dimitri. And what about the revenge ending? I personally think the revenge ending is the canon ending because I can't imagine after everything Dimitri did that Nico would work with him again. What does Phil tell Nico after he killed Dimitri? Great, thanks. Oh, I got a phone call from Bell, Phil. Hey, Phil, I understand why you made the decision you did. For what it's worth, I didn't trust that Dimitri neither. Yeah, well, I did what I had to do. Anyway, you and me can't talk no more. Jimmy's falling apart, the Pegorino ain't nothing no more. I'm out, man. Goodbye. 
that he didn't trust him either, and he understands why he did it. He said that Jimmy is losing it and he's out. Phil is smart to get out while he has a chance. And where is Phil during a Avengers tragedy? He's nowhere to be seen. He also gets out, because after what Dimitri pulled during that deal, he would refuse to work with him again. Phil's smart and honorable, and for that deserves to survive. And Pegorino gets so furious that his deal was ruined that he shoots up Roman's wedding. Now this is probably the dumbest thing Pegorino ha has done. The same guy you hired to kill your enemies, that is a one-man army, and cleaned up all your messes. You try to have him killed, and not only this, but you try to have him killed in broad daylight during a wedding with dozens of witnesses, and not only that, you don't even hit the guy you were gunning for. If you're gonna kill somebody like Nico, you better not miss. This honestly reminds me of Joey Zaza in The Godfather Part 3. While Zaza had a much better plan than Pegorino when he tried to kill the whole commission, he failed to get them all in the end. He missed several mob bosses, and all the families wanted him dead at this point. And what does Zaza do? He just walks the streets in public. If you're gonna take somebody out, you better not miss, and if you do, it's time to go into hiding. Pegorino is a dead man walking at this point. Nico's only mistake in this situation was thinking that Pegorino would somehow let him walk away. Uh, he even says how much of a fool he was in the ending. This time you're gonna be confronting Pegorino. Sorry. And the chase is a bit different. Picking up shit. It's dead for it. There's nowhere left for these guys to go. The whole city wants them dead now. Well, I guess I'll be doing the whole city a favor when I kill Pegorino then. The fool thought he could be a big player. This man will lead us there. We'll get him, cousin, I assure you. See him, Bridget. And I'll be after him. And then no way boy gonna live another day upon this earth. See it? It's a dead man. Dead man! Fuck with the wrong Rastan team. This he will realize soon enough. You motherfucker! Don't think for a second that this was anyone's fault but your own! You could've worked with me and everything would've been gravy! I wanted out, and you killed someone I cared about. It's over for you now, Jimmy. MOTHERFUCKER! In Pegorino's final cutscene, Nico says that he knows people on the commission, and that they think he's a joke, and it works in making Pegorino furious. Nico mocks him before his death, telling him that he's a nobody, and will die a nobody. Uh, uh. I told you to leave me alone. I told you to leave me alone. I got the orders here. Me! You're not looking so good there, Jimmy. Screw you. What the fuck did she ever do to you? I wanted you, you immigrant dipshit. Big talk. You want to know something funny? Not really. The commission? The old families? I know some of those guys. And they thought you were a fat fucking joke. Whatever. A joke! <laughs> ah. And did you notice what Pegorino says? I give the orders here, me! He always thinks he's some dumb big shot, but it was his own fault he never became a big shot. A narcissist that acted tough and had nothing to back it up with. So let's uh, go over here. Why does nobody respect Pegorino? And why, does, why do they think he's a joke? Well, this is the list. He's an Alderney family, because he's not a Liberty City family. The other families are not go are, are going to look down on him. This is the one thing he couldn't really do anything about. Number two, he inherited the family. While his father was some small-time gangster, Pegorino didn't work for what he had uh, and thought that he was entitled to the same privileges as the other families. Three, he talks tough and has nothing to back it up with. He's just a joke who talks about how powerful he is. If he really was powerful, he would show it. Number four, he lets people like the Pavanos walk over his turf and agrees to meet them in a secluded area. No family is going to respect someone that allows a rival family to operate on his territory. It shows he, he's weak and the Pavanos took clear advantage. Number five, he doesn't value his men 
and has them killed for stupid reasons. He doesn't show Phil, nor Nico, nor Anthony the proper respect. Number six, he hires dumb muscle without screening them. This causes a numerous rat incidents and police attention. Uh, number seven, he has way too much police attention. None of the other families have this many legal problems because they are more cautious about how they do business. Number eight, he has no connections. He doesn't know anybody. No politicians or corrupt police, no business leaders. He has contact with nobody while Gravelli has half the city in his pocket. Number nine, he has no respect for the mafia customs. He follows the customs stupidly, refusing to promote Phil when he is the best guy in the organization. That's the one time he should have actually violated the customs. He has Ray killed based on no evidence and beating up Anthony, a made man. Pegorino claims he respects the old ways, uh, but he doesn't. And lastly, number 10, working with Dimitri. The other families hated him and did not trust him. The Ancelotti's took a chance on Dimitri, and that's because they were desperate and in the it ended in disaster for them. The fact that Pegorino worked with Dimitri and let it slide when he got set up shows that he has no spine and poor judgment. And I can keep going on just how stupid Pegorino is. But here's the question. Could Pegorino have done something different to get on the commission? Well, I think so. I think he very much could have. Here's what uh, he could have done to get on the commission. First up, demand attacks in the Pavanos. He never should have met them at the abandoned industrial zone. The Pavanos went on your turf and were operating without cutting you in. He should have demanded a tax, a tribute from them. Instead, he tries to give them a tribute when they are on his turf. It's weakness. Pegarino should have gone all in and attacked every Pavano business in Alderney. Don't let them operate anything in Alderney without looking over their shoulder, as he says. If Pegarino damaged the Pavanos enough, they would have been pushed out of Alderney and sued for peace. This would have definitely impressed the other families that he was able to hold on to his turf and not back down, but instead, he just attacks them like once and this stops. Number two, stop hiring so much dumb muscle. Screen your people. Check who's joining. Hiring so much dumb muscle is going to get you noticed by the feds. Number three, treat your family with more respect. Phil didn't deserve the, the disrespect that he got. He was the most loyal to the Pegarinos. Anthony didn't deserve the dumb beatings. It contributed to him ratting. Ray didn't deserve to get whacked over nothing. And Marco and Pete didn't deserve to get disrespected the way they did. Marco and Pete were some, some of the dumb muscle Pegarino originally hired. But they were made men. Marco and Pete may have been dumb, but they had something that most others don't have, and that's loyalty. During the trip to meet the Pavanos, they praised Pegorino, but he just kept calling them idiots. And during the meeting, they shielded Pegorino and died protecting him. They gave their lives for him, and he couldn't be bothered to say one good thing about them. He says, well, too bad. They knew what they signed up for. These people come and go. No, Pegorino. You got them killed for your stupidity. If Pegorino was smart, he would have never gone to that meeting in the first place. A leader is responsible for the lives of his men, and Pegorino doesn't seem to get that. He's the boss, but there needs to be some respect between each other. Look at Gravelli's men. They idolize him, and he doesn't treat them like crap. And number four, promote Phil and Ray. Take a look at Roy Zito, for example. Roy Zito's story is a perfect example of loyalty. Hey, look, I stopped dealing with monster brats after Danny Lucasella tried to get her daddy to cut my balls off. Call me an asshole, but that was it for me. I know where you're coming from. The shit I got into after my night of indiscretion with Roy Zito. Oh, trying to claim I spiked his drink. Roy Z's a homo? He ain't a very good one. I never would have guessed it. Yeah, well, they don't wear a label on their head. Oh, look at this bitch behind the wheel. Now, who is Roy Zito exactly, and why he's, he's so important? Roy Zito is John Gravelli's underboss. He is the second in command of the most powerful mafia in all of America. Roy Zito is based on Vito Spadafor in The Sopranos. Vito was a capo regime in The Soprano family. He made the family very rich, and he knew construction really well. Now, in The Sopranos, Vito is secretly gay, the same as Zito. He is scared of the family finding out about this after a few rival mobsters catch him at a gay club. Tony's daughter's um, boyfriend actually finds out about this first, but never told the family about it until later on. Vito escapes to New England, and later on comes back because he wants to make money with the family. Now, the rest of the family wanted him dead, but when Vito came to Tony with a business proposition and offered him $200,000, Tony considered bringing him back in. Some of the family members um, got over it at this point, but another uh, family, the Lupertazzi family, headed by Phil Leotardo at this point, wanted him dead because Phil's cousin was Vito's wife. But Vito's wife begged begged Phil not to kill him. Phil wasn't doing it because he believed his family was insulted, but because he wanted to do a tough guy act in front of Tony and show um, Tony that he could kill one of his guys with no consequences. Tony agreed to have Vito killed because he didn't want to keep arguing with Phil, but Phil got to Vito first. When Tony tried to defend Vito, this is what Carlo, one of his guys, said. What? So I'm gonna burn that kind of dedication? It's hard to believe I couldn't get something more out of him if he were to come back. Stocks, offshore shit. 
I don't know. These other guys feel an effort should be made to find him and put him down for the honor of the family. Oh, please, huh? You know, certain people, they love the high drama, like fucking high school girls. And others I can name, they, they just can't wait to whack somebody, anybody. But some people feel it's against our principles, Tom. A sin. It's a sin. Probably the most ridiculous line in the whole show. These guys kill, rob, and intimidate others, and they think that being gay is immoral. They talk big about their family and loyalty, but they betrayed Vito. Vito was avenged um, later on, though, uh, when Fat Dom came over to the Sopranos and was talking crap about Vito's death, which got Silvio and Carlo angry, who ended up killing him. Uh, the moral uh, of the lesson with Vito is that Vito didn't do anything wrong. He did other bad things on his own. Sure, he was a gangster, but he never betrayed the family. What was important was that Vito didn't rat the family out or betrayed them. He made everyone rich, and that's all that matters. He was a good earner and loyal. Mafias run on money, not on feelings. Who cares if Vito was gay? It's irrelevant. They are acting like being gay is the equivalent of ratting out the family. They lost a giant source of money over stupidity. Vito being gay wasn't an issue. It was that he, was, he wasn't he was honest with his wife. That was the only issue. But these guys constantly cheat on their wives. They are in no position to condemn Vito. And going back to Roy Zito in GTA 4, Gravelli didn't make the same mistake that Tony did. There is no doubt in my mind that Gravelli knows that Zito is gay. There's no way he doesn't. Someone like Gravelli, with all the connections he has and how careful he is, he would 100% know that. But why didn't he take action against Zito? Because it was pointless, and it wasn't a big deal. Gravelli could care less who Zito dates. All he cares about is loyalty and results. There's a reason that Zito is Gravelli's second in command. Gravelli would only choose someone very loyal and who he trusts with his life to be underboss, and that's Zito. Zito makes the family a ton of money and knows how to manage their operations, and the other families don't dare say anything about Zito being gay. Why? Because Gravelli is way stronger than them, and he would threaten them, and wouldn't care what they have to say. He would say that Zito is loyal to me and makes us rich. Can your guys do better than him? He wouldn't care what they have to say, and that's loyalty between a boss and his family. That's a true brotherhood. And if you want to know just how much Zito appreciates Gravelli's support, the police report on him says that he offered Gravelli his kidney when he became sick. Gravelli rejected it. Why? Because for Gravelli, it's about what's good for the family, not what's good for himself. Yes, Gravelli is a criminal. He's He's a parasite, but he has way more honor than Pegorino. He thinks about the bigger picture. He knows his time is up and that Zito um, cutting out his kidney will do nothing for him and may cause Zito health problems later on where he won't be able to manage the family correctly. But Zito still cut out his own kidney and gave it to Gravelli in an ice bucket. Gravelli ends up passing away at the end of GTA 4, but that's pure loyalty right there. The fact that someone would cut out their kidney to save you. I can't think of any other way uh, that would show more loyalty. There's a reason that Gravelli kept him around. He was loyal. If Pegorino was in the same situation, he would have Zito killed, thinking that him being gay will damage his reputation, ignoring the fact that Zito is loyal and makes the family rich. It shows how emotion clouds Pegorino, and he doesn't think about the bigger picture. Does Pegorino um, have that good of a friendship with anyone in his family? No, not even Phil. Do you think that Ray would give his kidney to Pegorino? Hell no. And even Phil wouldn't. They have no reason to. Now, Pegorino should have promoted Phil Bell to consigliere. Phil should not have been an associate anymore. Phil should have been consigliere, the advisor to the Don. Now, I know people will say, but professional, what about the Mafia's rules? Isn't Phil 90% Irish, so wouldn't Pegorino be breaking the rules? Technically, yes, he would, but Pegorino broke other rules that are much uh, worse, such as beating up a made man and having Ray killed with no evidence. Remember that Gravelli did not care about Zito's sexuality. Phil's nationality shouldn't matter either. If any other family laughs at them, let them laugh. Pegorino could just say, Phil gets me results. He gets me stuff done. That's why I trust him as my consigliere. Uh, can yours do the same and do as good of a job as Phil? Results are all that matters, not someone's nationality or their sexuality. If Pegorino stood his grounds against the other family and explained why he promoted Phil, they would have been more impressed with him. But he has his smartest guy being an associate because of some stupid old mafia custom. It's nonsense. That's why he's a laughing stock. There is no reason Anthony should be a higher rank than Phil. It's pure stupidity. And going back to the Godfather, in the movie, it's not really discussed, but in the books, the Corleones get laughed at because Tom Hagen is their consigliere. Tom Hagen is not even 1% Italian. He's German and Irish. But how did he get to such a high position as advisor to the Don? It's because he is Vito Corleone's son, not by blood, but by adoption. He was Sonny's childhood friend who was homeless and he was adopted. Vito sees him as his son as well. And besides that, Tom is a very smart man. Maybe he's not the best for being a wartime consigliere, but he is great at making deals. He makes connections of 
with politicians, police officials, reporters, other mafias, and gangs on behalf of the Corleone family. And even though the other families tried to laugh at the Corleones for this, Tom got results done, which is what matters the most. Vito had the most amount of powerful people in his pocket. He made more money than all the other ma families. Mafias respect two things the most, power and money. If Pegorino grew a spine and stood up for his family instead of constantly sucking up to the commission, he might have earned their respect. And as for Ray, uh, why promote him to underboss? It's because Ray and Phil hate each other. If Pegorino promoted Phil to consigliere and Ray stayed as capo, that means that Phil would be much more powerful than Ray. Ray would be instantly jealous, and there's a high probability he might betray the family. Ray knows how to make money. If you keep him happy, there will be no issues. So Ray should be promoted to underboss. As underboss, he will be making sure the family's illegal operations are running and keep the capos in line. Get some capos together also. Ray could definitely do that. As for the conflict of Phil and Ray, Pegorino should sit them down and explain to Ray, I'm promoting Phil to consigliere because he has good judgment and I need an advisor. Having a good advisor is not a sign of weakness, by the way. Even the best leaders need to hear other points of view to make a decision. He then explains to Ray, I'm promoting you to underboss, so you'll be in charge of setting up deals and figuring out how to uh, make us money. And if they both keep uh, complaining about each other, Pegorino should tell Ray he screwed up with the diamonds and Phil nearly screwed up with the heroin. Mistakes happen. Don't let it happen again. Stop this conflict. The other families are screw screwing us because of it. Let's work together for the good of the family. If this crap starts up again and you guys start arguing, you will both have severe consequences. That's all Pegorino needs to do. Keep them both happy and have them put their differences aside. Now, while Ray is in charge of the family businesses, Phil should be in charge of recruitment as consigliere. Advise Pegorino on how to hire. Phil has contacts. As paranoid as he is. He has people he trusts. Have Phil find people that he knows are reliable, and then eventually you can have these people work their way up the soldier and beat capos. No more hiring dumb muscle. Advise Pegorino to watch his mouth. Stop talking business in the house, and while Ray is in charge of the family's deals, Phil should be there to advise beforehand, to give his input. If Phil was consigliere, Pegorino would have never got it, gotten into half of the problems he got into. He wouldn't have had all these fed problems because Phil would advise against talking business in the house. He wouldn't have gone to the meeting with the Pavanos because Phil would have told him it's a bad idea. And lastly, he wouldn't have gotten involved with Dimitri in the first place because Phil did not trust him. The fact that Phil um, uh, never did business with Dimitri but could see right through him shows how good of a consigliere he would be. Not even Nico could sense Dimitri's true nature. And the final thing Pegorino can do to get on the commission is kill Dimitri. Pegorino works with the guy the other families refuse to work with. They hate Dimitri. And Pegorino gets screwed over. His guys nearly get killed and he celebrates it like it's some kind of win. The idiot. What Pegorino should have done is immediately declare war on Dimitri and end the partnership after that deal. It doesn't matter that he got the money and Dimitri the heroin. It should have never have gone down like that. Phil and Nico nearly got killed. Pegorino should have gone to the mattresses and got rid of not only Dimitri, but his entire organization. He should have wiped the whole thing out. Think about it. Killing Dimitri would be killing two birds with one stone. It would work tremendously in his favor. Dimitri is hated by the other families. Gravelli despises him. The Ancelottis are pissed about their deals um, falling out. And the other families don't trust him. And he's expanding into their turf. If Pegorino killed Dimitri off, it would gain him respect and reputation. He's trying to build a reputation for himself. This is where he could get it. He gains the other family's respect by taking out a guy they all hate and is causing them problems. And on top of that, he shows that he's the boss of Alderney. He makes it clear that you mess with me and my family. You try to get my guys killed. This is what happens when you cross me. He establishes his position as somebody not to be messed with. It's the perfect way to get into the commission. Show that he won't tolerate being messed with and kill a guy that the entire commission hates. But why didn't he get respect when Nico kills him? Because everyone knows um, he was doing the deal with Dimitri. And everyone on the streets knows Nico killed Dimitri because of the beef that they had. If Pegorino made it clear he's going after Dimitri and told the other families this is between us, stay out of it, they would have gladly stayed out of it. They hate both Pegorino and Dimitri, but Dimitri is an actual threat to them. They hate him more. They would gladly let Pegorino fight him. And if Pegorino comes out on top uh, with minimal losses, and quickly, they would be impressed. And that is his ticket to the commission. But instead, Pegorino's an idiot. He thinks he can do everything on his own, doesn't listen to any of his people, is stupid enough to discuss business in his home, sucks up the other families and the commission, and lets them walk all over him on his turf, treats his guys like garbage, doesn't know the right people to promote, hires so much dumb muscle, and does business with the most untrustworthy guy ever.
You know the Soprano family is referred to as a glorified crew, but at least they are glorified, where the Pegarinos are a joke and nothing more. Pegarino is ultimately based on Phil Leotardo, the final main antagonist of the Sopranos. Phil is arguably the worst boss in the series. He takes things way too personally and doesn't seem to understand the Mafia's main purpose is to make money, not run on feelings and emotions. I am going to summarize the character really quickly. Uh, if you haven't watched The Sopranos, uh, there's going to be a lot of spoilers here, but I do recommend that you watch it, especially if you like the uh, story of the Pegarino family. So anyways, Phil Leotardo was a capo regime of the Lubertazzi crime family, and the same family the Soprano family dealt with. Now what ends up happening in the show is Carmine Lubertazzi dies from a stroke. This creates a massive power struggle where Johnny um, Sacrimoni, the underboss, wants to be boss, and little Carmine, the boss's son, wants to be boss. It starts a civil war in the family. Angelo, the consigliere of the family, gets Tony Blondetto, a cousin of Tony Soprano, to kill Joey Pepperali, who was Johnny Sack's right-hand man. What ends up happening is John Sacramoni figures it out and has Phil and his brother kill Angelo. After Angel Angelo's murder, Tony Blundetto goes after the Leotardo brothers for revenge because they were very close friends in prison. Phil's brother Billy dies, and Phil survives and swears vengeance on Blundetto. This gets really bad because now Johnny is threatening Tony and telling him to hand Blundetto, Blundetto over. After Blundetto flees, uh, Tony tracks him down and kills him instantly with a shotgun. It was a mercy killing for his cousin, because he knew if Phil captured him, he would have tortured him. Eventually, little Carmine gives up, and John Sacrimony takes over as full boss. Phil Leotardo becomes his underboss, and later on, John gets arrested, where Phil, Phil becomes acting boss. After John's sentencing, Phil becomes the full boss of the family. Now, why is Phil the worst boss, and he is strongly based on Pegarino? It's because he never critically thinks and uses his emotions for everything. For example, there is a running joke in the Sopranos community about Phil doing 20 years in the can. Here are the clips of it. I did 20 fucking years. Nah, what are you talking about? 20 years inside. Not a fucking peep. You want compromise? How's this? 20 years in the can. I wanted money out. I compromised. Now, Phil takes personal pride in the fact that he spent 20 years inside and never ratted anyone out. While he didn't rat anyone out, he expects people to respect him because of his 20-year prison sentence. The reality is, no one cares. He thinks that everyone is going to sympathize with him, but in reality, they don't care. He also gets angry at Tony for never spending any time inside, but Tony was smart enough not to get caught. The veto situation that happened shows just how dumb of a boss Phil is. He became obsessed with this. Remember, Vito Spada 4 is that cavalry regime in the Sopranos family that was revealed to be gay, and he goes on the run. His wife is Phil's cousin. Phil is doing this to basically show off to his guys that he's a big tough guy and will have Vito killed for supposedly dishonoring his family. The reality was, there was no incident here. There was no situation here, it was not a big deal, if anything it was just bad that Vito wasn't honest with his wife. But these guys cheat on their wives all the time including Phil. Yet when Vito is gay, they act like this is the worst possible thing ever. Vito wasn't ratting or betraying the family and he made everyone rich. This was a situation they should have all forgotten about, yet Phil kept making a big deal out of it. I do for you, Phil. Vito. Do we know where he's at? Well, that really doesn't concern you. How's John? I don't know. Fine, through his veil of tears. But seriously, Vito. Okay? But don't you fucking tell me what to do. You're only acting, boss. I swallowed my pride when your murdering fuck of a cousin killed my brother. Don't think I'm gonna do it twice. Philip, let's not make a beef where there isn't one. Fundamentally, we are in agreement on this issue. But I'll handle it. Heard on 1010 Windsor, tell us a parking lot. I hope you didn't get caught in that. You said you're gonna take care of that fucking Fenoik. Oh, for Christ's sake, fucking Vito again? What the fuck is wrong with you? He's in town, isn't he? I was at Marie's the other night. She played the innocent. But I could tell she'd seen him. You're fucking corn actor great now, too, huh? I gotta tell you, Anthony, if Vito was here and you knew about it, fuck this. I know Vito's bottom was impacted, if that's what you're referring to. <laughs> Call him what you will, but you're talking about one of my captains. Captain? The good ship Lollipop, right? Phil, please. Please, my ass. The man was a fucking disgrace. But before he came out of the closet, he worked for me. And he put a lot of money in my pocket. And yours, too. And notice when Tony tells Phil he made you rich, he doesn't deny it, but doesn't care either. Like I said, the main purpose of a mafia family is to generate money for the family. That's its only purpose, not going on some ridiculous crusade over nonsense. 
Phil doesn't seem to understand this. Tony understands that Vito made them rich. Vito came back after he fled and offered Tony $200,000 as a tribute to the boss and told the boss that he would run the family's operations in Atlantic City so he isn't too close to them. Tony considered the offer and wanted to do it that way, but he couldn't keep fighting Phil or his own guys on it and agreed to have him killed. Before he could do that, Phil did it and was pri it was primarily a message to Tony that he could kill one of his guys and get away with it. Now these guys all changed their tune the moment that they found out that Phil did it. But what ends up happening is one of Phil's guys that was involved in the murder of Vito, Dom, goes over to Satriel's, a Sopranos family front, and starts talking crap about Vito's death. This causes Silvio, Tony's consigliere, and Carlo, a soldier, to kill him. Now even though they killed a made man, this was very much justified. Vito was still a made man, and while the Sopranos were planning on killing him, they killed one of their made men first, without their permission. And the guy comes over here and starts talking crap about the guy he killed. Dom was basically saying, I can kill your guy and come on your turf and talk crap and you can't do anything about it. Well, he was proven wrong. Later on, Coco, a soldier in the Lupertazzi family, threatens Tony's daughter. Must be fun talking her at night, huh? Is there a problem? Not yet. Would you like one? Coco. What? I'm saying hello. Come on, let's go. A bestia dad, huh? <laughs> Tony gets really angry and goes over to Little Italy and beats the crap out of him. This was a justified beating. It doesn't matter that Coco was a made man. He threatened Tony's daughter. Made man can't threaten the family of another fam uh, another made man, especially the boss of another family. The point here is that Tony was not going to let these people walk all over him. Pegorino took the disrespect and did nothing about it until the Pavanos betrayed him. Well, he shouldn't have taken any disrespect at all. Phil holds a constant grudge against Tony over Vito and Blundetto when both of these incidents were not Tony's fault. He can't come to any reasonable discussion, and when little Carmine tries to resolve the conflict, it fails because of Phil's temper. There's one thing my father taught me, it's this. A pint of blood costs more than a gallon of gold. My business, all of our businesses, this infighting's costing money. I'm willing to move forward. Let the past be bygones. Fine with me. Your brother Billy, whatever happened there? All right, then. Whatever nah. happened there? The shooting. Whatever happened there? God rest his soul. Huh? I'll tell you what fucking happened. This piece of shit's cousin Calm put down, six Phil. bullets in the kid without any provocation whatsoever. My cousin's dead. Fuck you. Phil. Hey, we were making headway here. I didn't mean to Fuck say... Fuck what you meant, cocksucker. Come on. Now what I love about that scene is that Tony stands up for Vito, saying that he was talking about one of his captains, and little Carmine was right that a drop of blood is worth more than a bucket of gold. Tony just wants to get back to business while Phil is constantly annoyed and talking crap, inflaming tensions. During this tension, they are losing money. It's pointless arguing. Little Carmine soon realizes that Phil is very much a problem. He organizes a meeting, and Phil acts like a child kicking them off his property. Phil is not accepting visitors right now. I just talked to him on the phone, but she... Well, I just talked to him in person. He ain't seeing nobody. What's going on, Butch? I just brokered this thing. He came here to make a peace offering. A semi-trail of drills, Makitas. We don't want your fucking drills. Fuck it. Let's go. That's right, cocksucker. Go back to New Jersey. Phil, what are you doing? Take that piece of shit and get off my stoop. But we just talked about this. Well, cooler heads prevail. Uncle Philly. Uncle Philly, my ass. Will you just come down so we can discuss this? There's nothing left to discuss, Carmine. I don't understand. Why is he like this? That scene is to show how childish Phil is. He can't even be bothered to answer the door and has his underboss Butch do it and kicks people off his property after organizing a meeting. I don't think Phil ever planned on meeting Tony and Little Carmine. He just invited them over to kick them out to piss them off. That's how childish this guy is, just like Pegorino. And this is the final time that Tony and Phil met. Uh, the other thing, this asbestos. I thought about your offer. What do you say, to 15% plus we forget about the balance uh, what you owe me on the vitamin truck? First off, it wasn't an offer. It's my position, 25%. That's it? What else would you like me to say? Come on, Phil, well, what's the problem? I come here in good faith. I make a reasonable count. Which I considered and rejected. Point where business bleeds into other shit. 
feelings make things financially unfeasible. Charles Schwab over here. <laughs> <laughs> So that's it. No leeway, no compromise, just stupid fucking jokes. You want compromise? How's this? 20 years in the can. I wanted Manicot. I compromised. I ate grilled cheese off the radiator instead. I wanted to fuck a woman, but I compromised. I jacked off in a tissue. You see where I'm going? Yeah. Phil mocks him and can't even negotiate and ruins an opportunity for his family to make more money over his personal feelings. It's all emotion and no brain with this guy, the same as Pegorino. And to show just how ignorant um, Phil is, listen to who his hero is. Who knows who is Leonardo da Vinci? Annabella. He was a painter of the Mona Lisa. Very good. He was not only a painter, he did medical drawings and he designed a tank for the army. Wow. Leonardo was a great Italian, and that was our name originally, Leonardo. But many years ago, when my grandpa came over from Sicily, they changed it at Ellis Island to Leotardo. Why did they do that for? Because they're stupid, that's why, and jealous. They disrespected a proud Italian heritage and named us after a ballet costume. I don't think his last name ever was Leonardo. I think he convinced himself it was Leonardo or he is lying about it. It's commonly believed in history that Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci was in fact gay. It's extremely ironic that Phil considers him uh, his hero when he is extremely homophobic. Now, while it's not 100% proven that Leonardo da Vinci was gay, there's a lot of evidence to suggest it. For example, back then homosexuality was considered sodomy by the Florentine government in Italy. He was accused of this, but it was never proven. He never married and he was very close to his pupil, Soleil. Soleil was not a talented artist, but he lived with Leonardo for many years. While it's not 100% confirmed he was gay, it's highly believed. Any amateur historian of Leonardo da Vinci uh, would be able to easily tell you this. This was the early 2000s. They still had internet, and even without uh, the internet, there's plenty of history books that you can read about Leonardo da Vinci's personal life to find that out. It shows that Phil doesn't even know anything about the guy he admires. Uh, he absolutely hates Vito for being gay, but then he admires Leonardo da Vinci. The funny thing is, these mobsters talk about how proud they are to be Italian, but they know nothing about Italian history. They either don't know Italian, or they can barely speak it. Leonardo represents the best of the Italian people, a famous artist and inventor, while Phil represents the worst of his people, a scummy mob boss. How did you honor the Leonardo name? By joining the mafia and spreading corruption and terror? And this doesn't end Phil's story. He starts a stupid war with the Soprano family over his feelings. In the war, Bobby um, Bacchilari, um, Tony's underboss, is killed, and Silvio, Tony Consul... Tony's consigliere is severely wounded. Tony goes into hiding, but does it differently than Phil, where he still keeps contact with his guys and is planning. But Phil, on the other hand, goes into full hiding and leaves his guys to fend for themselves. Word yet. No one knows where our friend is. It's not that there's no word, it's that there's no progress. Nobody's taking this lightly, Phil. He should have been done first. They thought they'd find them both at the strip joint. I've heard this already. But I know you're disappointed, Phil. Fucking A, I'm disappointed. I'm thinking, I don't know, maybe... What? You talking about reaching out? We can't go back. Are you out of your fucking mind? No, I know. Then what'd you say it for? I didn't, Phil. You did. Listen, kid, when this is over, we're gonna sit down. Me and you. I hope so. I can't hear you. You're breaking up. I said I hope... <laughs> No one is going to follow a leader like that. When Butch walks from Little Italy to Chinatown, it shows just how lost he is. He has no direction, no leadership. No one will follow a leader like this. Someone who starts a fight and then runs for cover, leaving his guys in the crossfire. If this exact same situation happened, Phil would have stayed with uh, Pegorino if he had taken a leadership position. I'm talking about Phil Bell, by the way. Phil Bell would back Pegorino in a war if Pegorino actually stayed there. But if he's going to go on the run and have to have Lee, Phil, and Ray, and everyone else defend for themselves, he would then sell Pegorino out just like Ray would. Anyone would. Why should you follow a leader who screws you over? Butch agrees to a ceasefire, and Phil stays on the run, completely oblivious to the fact that the war has ended. And Phil dies in the exact same way that Pegorino dies. He gets shot in the head. I gotta make a phone call. I'll meet you at the drugstore. Tell the goddamn pharmacist to call Dr. Iaconis. I should get a 60-day supply of the plavix. <laughs> Oh, shit. 
but I do believe that Phil's head getting crushed by the SUV is meant to be symbolic. Symbolic in the sense that his face was destroyed, and no one will remember what he looked like. No one will remember him. He was a joke, but despite Pegorino being based on Phil Leotardo, there's a key difference between them. Pegorino ran a weak family that had no power and was seen as a joke. Phil ran one of the most par powerful mafias in all of America. He had hundreds of associates and soldiers, and yet he ran it into the ground. It shows that even with a really powerful organization, all it takes is one stupid leader to mess everything up. Phil's family may have disliked the Sopranos um, heavily, but in the end, they just wanted to get back to business and make money. Phil let his personal feelings cloud his judgment. He thought about what's good uh, for him, uh, not what's good for the family, just like what Pegorino does. He believed that it, believes that it's all about him. Sure, has, um, do what the boss says, but he has to look at the bigger picture. He's a leader and is, reasonable and is responsible for his organization. People don't follow leaders just because they want to, but because they respect them and because they will be rewarded under the leader for following them. Pecorino is ultimately a toothless tiger. He may appear threatening to some, but he's just a small-time gangster who thinks he's big and in reality, has no power. After his death, Kenny Petrovich, the most powerful Russian mafia boss in Liberty City, takes it over and uses it as a base of operations to attack the Angels of Death and the Ancelotti's who are dealing drugs in South Alderney. This shows that Pegorino had good turf, he had good territory, he just didn't know how to run it. And one thing I noticed about Petrovich, I don't know if this is intentional or not, but he doesn't talk business inside the house, but on the side of the house and in the garage, places that are much less likely to be bugged. He's already doing something that Pegorino wasn't. If you want to know what happened to Pegorino's home after the game and how the Russian Mafia took it over, check out my lore video on Kenny Petrovich. I will have it linked up on the screen at the end. And that is the story of Jimmy Pegorino, a nobody who thought he was somebody. Even after his death, no one will remember him. Big Smoke was right that people will at least remember him because Big Smoke at least got somewhere, but Pegorino got nowhere. Thank you guys for watching this lore project. It's one of my longest projects ever. If you did enjoy it, please do drop a like. It does help me to make more content like this. And I'll see you guys on the next one. Take care, everyone. Have a wonderful day, guys.